Добрий день, пані Тапанова, шановні колеги. Радий вітати вас в Одесі. Дуже приємно, що ну, я вважаю, що Одеса – це знакове місце для обговорення товарних бірж та товарних деривативів, тому що колись да, наші співвітчизники, ну, мабуть, так я можу сказати, да, 100 років, 150 років мали цей ринок. На жаль, Да, він не відбувся да, за, за деяких геополітичних причин, але ми його мали. Нам потрібно зараз а, а, зрозуміти, що нам, а, а, куди, куди нам направити ці реформи з метою створення повноцінного ринку товарного та а, інтеграції українського ринку до а, світового. А, у нас сьогодні дуже цікава панель, а, дуже а, а, Високого рівня фахівці. Хочу вам представити Кевіна Пікелі, Піколі зліва від мене. Він заступник директора Офісу з міжнародних відносин комісії з нагляду за фьючерсними товарними ринками Сполучених Штатів. Має дуже багатий досвід, в тому числі і працював в інноційних банках, банків Нью-Йорк, Прайс і останні декілька років вже працює в CFTC та відповідає за міжнародну, міжнародну працю. Далі Оуен, Оуен Джонсон, він керуючий директор Чикагської товарної біржі, він відповідає за дослідження ринків енергоресурсів та розвитку нових продуктів. Опікується енергетичними фьючерсами групи CME і чотири роки він працював на Дубайській товарній біржі, яка входить до Чикагської товарної біржі. Далі Леа Сарока, вона програмний менеджер Agro Financial Services IFC, дуже плідно працює над програмною Програмою, яку я всі втілює в Україні щодо розвитку аграрних розписок, має дуже багатий досвід впровадження фінансових інструментів, інструментів в інших країнах, в тому числі Афганістані, ну і до цього в Канаді. Далі у нас Олег Каченко, він у нас 25 років вже займається розвитком біржової торгівлі в Україні. От, 25 буде в наступному році, я вважаю. Да? Тобто ми заздалегідь тобі, тебе да, хочемо побажати все ж таки швидше добратися да, до нашої цілі, але це, це наша суспільна мета. Тобто Олег має дуже великий досвід і останні 10 років він очолює українську біржу і веде її до світлого майбутнього. Також Олексій Дубовкий очолює Українську енергетичну біржу. За останні декілька років, враховуючи реформи енергетичного сектору, Українська енергетична біржа досягає певних позитивних моментів. І ми вважаємо, що буде дуже цікаво послухати, які він а, має у нас а, думки з цього приводу. Тому, а, мабуть, ми почнемо з, з Оуена, а, з його презентації і а, послухаємо, що можна сказати. А, мабуть, я би хотів ще попросити так, щоб надати Оуену трошки, а, знаєте, як в хокеї вбрасування. Якщо там можуть відкрити а, слайд, а, а, шановні наші Организатор презентации. А где у нас у нас вечер? Там. Я, я бы хотел сказать про наступное. Да, у нас сегодня в Украине Uh, да, у нас є слайд про наші українські ринки. Uh, дуже активна дискусія у нас зараз відбувається по ринку енергоносіїв та аграрному ринку. Uh, Україна є дуже впливовим uh, гравцем на світовому ринку uh, 
товару. Ми бачимо, що у нас є природний газ, але ціну ми встановлюємо за терміналом в Австрії. У нас є вугілля, але там ціна Роттердам. У нас є електроенергія, ну, ми розуміємо, що ціна регулюється. І аграрні позиції все ж таки це Чикаго. Тобто у нас є питання хабу, да, і Україна залишається прайстейкером. Ми не можемо дати нашим гравців інструменту для хеджування ризики. Тому залишаємося дуже відкритими да, для риночних наслідків да, колування ціни. Ви бачите, що за обсягом цих ринків це більше, ну, тільки ці товарні позиції складають 30% нашого зовсім. Тому, говорячи про сталий економічний розвиток, ми повинні розуміти, що якщо ми не даємо нашим економічним учасникам повноцінних інструментів фінансових, ми відкриті до майбутніх проблем з коливання ціни. І це питання сталого економічного розвитку, який у нас сьогодні стає. Тому, Ови, будь ласка, розкажіть, як ви вважаєте, можна побудувати ринок в Україні? Не підключитися до Чикагської біржі, а побудувати Одеську Чикагську біржу. Дякую. Let's wait for those slides. That's a handsome man, but no slides. so much um so i'll just walk you through who we are and where we came from because where we came from is certainly to a certain extent where you are now and where you might be going in the future so we started really in the 19th century as a risk management exchange for the agricultural sector just as we've been discussing slightly earlier it's the transfer of risk from farmers to processors that gave birth to this revolution in futures, which really started in Chicago in the 19th century. And we moved from the guys at the top, who are shouting the numbers, down to the big floor, which only recently closed, and then on now to the giant servers, everything moving electronically. So this was the evolution of the risk management process. Now, I'm passionate about the role of exchanges in development. I believe that exchanges stand at the centre of most economic systems and without a powerful exchange, a strong exchange, it's very difficult for you to move forward, particularly in commodities where the price is so opaque, but also in interest rates, in foreign exchange, in equity indexes, in all these areas an exchange is fundamental. I'm going to focus on commodities. The key with commodities is that they are so different every time and there is so much risk. A commodity can move so quickly and so dramatically that it can lead to bankruptcies. You need a strong exchange at the centre of that. Now Ukraine has great potential and it's making great progress already with my colleagues on the left, uh, particularly on the energy and on the equity side, we're seeing a lot of progress. It's, it's an area that's of great interest to our customers. We get a lot of inquiries about agricultural products, about natural gas. We're looking at some things ourselves. There are a huge amount of opportunities as development takes place, but there are also limiting factors. The key factor always and this is where the exchange can play such an important role, is transparency. Price reporting and price benchmarks. So the key is always to develop the benchmarks first. So to this point, you need a price benchmark. What is the value of black sea corn today? Difficult, difficult. There's not one single number. What's the price of corn in Chicago today? 
I can check that on my phone now. I can see that on the phone, I can see it on Reuters and Bloomberg, I can see it on the TV. I can't necessarily see the price of Ukrainian gas, of corn. That's what I need to be able to see in order to develop a product, a risk management product. So the first thing, the fundamental is benchmarks. After benchmarks comes exchanges. With benchmarks and exchanges, you already have the beginning of a very positive ecosystem. So I really believe this is the way to go. Now, how do we develop products then? We develop them on uh, various work streams. So if, if this was my project now, uh, to develop, for example, a black sea corn contract or a sunflower oil contract, I would be looking at the commercial side, the operational side, and the regulatory side. Those would be my three work streams. This is how we operate. So commercially, is there a need in the market? Will people pay money? Absolutely, there's a need in the market. Banks want to know before they lend what the value of this product. Farmers, processors, they all want to know the value and they want to manage their risk. So yeah, commercially, I don't see there's a problem. Operationally, what are we going to do? Are we going to develop a cash benchmark that settles to an index? Or are we going to settle physically? Are we going to deliver the product in a location, at a terminal, at a grain elevator, at a port? So we kind of make those decisions. What kind of size of product? What kind of specification? So that's the operational stream that we have to solve. And then thirdly would be the regula regulatory stream. Who will be able to trade this product? Who's qualified? Who is licensing the product? Are banks able to trade it? Or is it just physical players? Are we going to restrict it? Is the regime from your regulator sufficient that an international participant will want to trade it? Or will it be domestic? So that would be my third work stream is figuring out the, the regulatory side of it. How is that going to play out? Because in order to become a major benchmark, it has to be more than domestic. It has to be accessed by international players. They have to be confident to trade into your jurisdiction. So that's a very important part. So uh, I'm conscious of time. I could talk about this for weeks. Uh, I've spent years thinking about this. Uh, but in the interest of sharing the microphone, uh, fundamentally build benchmarks. From benchmarks everything flows. Secondly, build strong exchanges. Strong exchanges that work domestically, but strong exchanges that work for international audience. Through that, I don't see any reason why you can't replicate the success that Chicago has had as a commodity trading centre. Benchmarks and then exchanges at the heart of all economic development. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Owen, for, uh, for the um, uh, very straightforward and, and structured uh, presentation. Now, враховуючи, що Owen відмітив прогрес наших учасників ринку в формуванні спотового ринку в Україні щодо аграрної продукції та енергетичної, я думаю, що у Олексія є, є зараз можливість додати а, а, своє, своє бачення щодо можливості формування цих бенчмарків на енергетичному ринку. Достатньо ли у нас а, учасників ринку, достатньо ли у нас а, об'єму, достатньо ли у нас прозорості ціновою, а, щоб все ж таки а, ну, просуватися в цьому напрямку. Олексій, будь ласка. Спасибо, Тимур. Хотелось бы сказать, что в нашей стране сейчас идут реформы. Часть этих реформ связана с либерализацией рынков, энергетических рынков. Как вы знаете, такие же либерализации проходят и в Европе. Идет внедрение третьего энергопакета. И в принципе мы сейчас движемся, наша страна движется по 
образу и подобию тех реформ, которые проходили несколько лет назад в Евросоюзе. Эти реформы призваны к устранению монополий, олигополий на энергетических рынках. И говоря о том, чего нам за какой-то год с лишним времени там удалось достигнуть, приведу несколько цифр. Объем торгов за год с лишним составил 22 миллиарда гривен. На сегодняшний день у нас торгуют порядка 600 участников по различным секциям. Кто эти участники? Например, английская компания GKX, которая представлена в Украине Полтавской нефтегазовой, это добытчик. Также несколько добывающих частных компаний Бурисмы, государственная укргаздобыча торгуют свои нефтепродукты и другие там импортеры, трейдера. За это время проведено там более 500 торговых сессий, заключено порядка 13 тысяч контрактов, которые закончили стопроцентной поставкой. То есть все вышли на экспирацию. Это очень важно, поскольку внедрена нормальная модель управления рисками. И все эти контракты закончились поставкой от продавца к покупателям. На следующем слайде представлены объемы, которые торгуются. Назад можно? Если мы говорим о нефтепродуктах, бензин от внутреннего производства это порядка 21%, от дизель тоже порядка 21%, LPG порядка 15%. И с начала этого года запустили природный газ. Немного уголь, но уголь пока как бы нету никакой ликвидности. Интересно по природному газу. То есть с каждым месяцем, начиная с января, ликвидность прирастала. То есть когда мы начинали, было там порядка 10-15 участников, сейчас это порядка 70 участников. Это трейдерские компании, импортеры, добытчики. И начали выходить и конечные потребители. На сегодняшний день небольшой объем проторгован, да, но это постоянные стабильные торги, пока это ежемесячные форварда. В принципе, мы надеемся, что ликвидность будет прирастать и с начала следующего года, когда Укртрансгаз внедрит ежедневную балансировку, то ликвидность должна значительно повыситься. Но на сегодняшний момент даже те форварда, которые торгуются, месячные форварда, они довольно-таки интересные, поскольку мы видим арбитраж между рынками, когда импортеры закупают на хабах газ, здесь и перепродают с определенной своей маржой. На следующем слайде мы расскажем, да, я расскажу о тех инструментах, которые торгуются на энергетической бирже. Основные, конечно, это спотовые контракты, это с реальным товаром. Они торгуются внутри страны, экспорт, реформаты и импорт, кое-что тоже сюда импортируется. Контракты на условиях форвард с месячной, трехмесячной, полугодовой и годовым сроком поставки. Потом интересный запустили мы контракт где-то полгода назад, это торговля дифференциалами. Что это означает? Берется мировая котировка, допустим, Аргуса, Плаца, и от нее торгуются дисконт или премия. Вчера были интересные торги. Первые запустили это метанол. Метанол – это продукт, который используется в добывающей промышленности. Это такой химический момент. Раньше это при прошлых да, там, руководствах, раздобыч, это был самый коррупционный продукт который, не имея внутреннего да, украинского ценообразования, импортировался по каким-то ну, совершенно космическим ценам. Вчера проторговался этот продукт термы там, на три месяца. И, в принципе, если говорить открыто, то цена была дешевле, чем спота. То есть то, что можно купить сейчас, они купили на три месяца вперед дешевле рын рынка физического товара. Что... Сказать о волатильности. Да, на этом рынке есть волатильность. Пока она у нас никак не хеджируется, поскольку у нас работает только спотовый рынок. Но я надеюсь, в будущем, когда 
будут проведены да, какие-то остальные там реформы, будет запущен и срочный рынок, и я надеюсь, у участников будет возможность хеджировать свои риски с помощью деривативов. Также для участников, я думаю, кредитование будет дешевле, когда банки будут знать о том, что их ценовые риски захеджированы. Говоря о европейском рынке природного газа, на слайде представлены газовые биржи в Европе, которые торгуются. Согласно 312 регламента ЕС, эти рынки либерализуются, и каждая из стран, создавая свой газовый хаб, по-разному строила этот рынок, у всех приблизительно одинаковые модели рынка, но по дизайну они иногда отличаются, и где-то есть более развитые хабы, такие как TFTF, там NCG, когда-то некоторые есть менее развитые, например, как польский там газовый хаб, но там структура рынка такова, что биржа энергетическая польская, она связана там с одним монополистом, у них ПНИК, но государство его в этом случае, их антимонопольный комитет, обязал постепенно больше и больше продукции продавать через биржевые торги с анонимным принципом торгов. У них сначала было 35%, сейчас 55% рынка торгуются через биржу. И слайд по бенчмаркам. Следующий, пожалуйста. То, что говорил коллега СИИМИ, вот это вот интересные кривые. Если мы посмотрим на красную кривую, это результаты торгов за первое полугодие газом на нашей украинской энергетической бирже. Если мы посмотрим на голубую желтую линию, это цена НАКО по предоплате и с отсрочкой. Вот эти вот три линии чуть ниже, которые между собой там на 100% коррелируют, это три газовых хаба. TTF, NCG и Газпул. И коричневая линия – это э, почем закупали наши госпредприятия через систему Прозора. Если мы умножим вот эту вот разницу в цене на объем, который они закупили, вот там по месяцам видно, да, переплата всего госсектора, то за это первое полугодие Переплата госпредприятий составила 2 миллиарда 300 миллионов гривен. Конечно, в какой-то степени, вы не подумайте, что я хочу покритиковать Прозора, мы сами являемся членом Прозора, но суть вопроса в том, что есть моменты, которые, скажем так, не решены в Прозор, это всего там три шага аукциона. Все-таки комодити, да, товары, взаимозаменяемые должны торговаться на биржах. И об этом говорит и европейский, и американский опыт. На самом деле, выводя из тени этот рынок, Прозора сделала очень много. Но на сегодня те продукты, которые даже у Кыргоздобыча переводят, которые они раньше закупали на Прозор, сейчас переводят на закупку биржевых механизмов, говорит о том, что каждый из покупатели, продавцов ищут более эффективные механизмы продаж. На некоторых торгах у нас бывает более 100 шагов на повышение или на понижение, пока люди уторгуют свои позиции. Поэтому от прозрачного ценообразования в первую очередь выигрывает реальный сектор, во вторую очередь, конечно, выигрывает государство, которое должно быть и первоочередно заинтересовано в прозрачном ценообразовании, поскольку это и трансферное ценообразование, это и уплата налогов, единые правила для всех в плане э, прихода новых участников, э, инвесторов и, э, скажем так, внедрение реформ. Э, что еще хотелось бы сказать? И на сегодняшний момент э, мы считаем, что Рынок, который товарный, да, там, энергетический зародился, он имеет право на жизнь, он будет развиваться. Отдельное спасибо, хотелось бы сказать, НБУ, которая поменяла 410-е постановление и нам позволили принимать гарантийное обеспечение в валюте для того, чтобы управлять рисками. 
Дальше хочу сказать о антимонопольном комитете, который некоторые рынки, которые монополизированы или олигополизированы на сегодняшний день, в своих рекомендациях рекомендуют все-таки участникам часть продукции, хотя бы 10% торговать через биржи, чтобы повысить конкурентность этих рынков. И, в принципе, наверное, тоже отдельное спасибо хотелось бы сказать и Укргаздобычи, НАК Нафтогазу, которые, внедряя реформы, антикоррупционные реформы, где-то помогают нам в, скажем так, внедрении новых инструментов, да, то есть прозрачных продаж, прозрачных закупок. Я надеюсь, что в целом от, это, от этих моментов выиграет экономика в целом, и в частности наша страна будет более конкурентоспособна, поскольку не надо забывать, что мы все-таки живем в глобальном мире и те же самые соседи наши, да, там поляки, словаки и так далее в глобальном мире они там являются нашими конкурентами, нам надо быть более конкурентными по сравнению с ними, вот, поэтому и я извини, я тут да. просто уже пошла по 15 минут все, да. В принципе, я закончил. У тебя еще будет возможность. Я закончил, да. К сожалению, я просто сказать. ждал подяки комиссии, но не дочка. Не... Всем ты... раздавали, а нам Тимур, забыл. ты как раз меня перебил на это. Да? Я надеюсь. А, ну, тоди, тоди, тоди дважды, но в кинси. Добрый, да. Окей. А, а, Алексей, дякую, да, дякую тебе за информативную презентацию. Да. А, мы понимаем, что реформы тривают, рынки изменяются. А, что важливо, да, я бы хотел на, на, на этом моменте передать надати можливість Олегу да, сказати про те, що, на жаль, Олексій не сказав, але він був дуже зайнятий формулювати, що зараз відбувається, і там дуже багато. Но, ми розуміємо, що фінансові біржі все ж таки отримали певну інституціоналізацію. Да, вони мають, хоча й недолуги, на мій погляд, да, але все ж таки якесь підґрунтя з точки зору Инструментарий. То есть клиринг есть, у нас есть закон про ценные паперы. Ну, что-то все же таки есть. Да? Товарные биржи у нас функционируют, на жаль, за отсутствием любого регулирования. У нас с Министерством экономического развития есть договоренность и, и Кабмином, что нагляд за товарными биржами будет все же таки передан до, до комиссии. И наша цель в этом случае не, не отримати так званий да, double fold. Да. Ми не хотіли би, щоб товарний сегмент пішов таким же напрямком, який рухався у нас, на жаль, да, ринок цінних паперів. Да. Ми, ми б хотіли б все ж таки якісно а, розуміти, да, повноцінно розуміти ті проблеми, які ми, ми зараз маємо, їх врахувати і а, надати дуже суттєвий і якісний поштовх товарному а, а, рынку та а, рынку ценных паперов. Олег, а, будь ласка, расскажи нам про, про те, как ты бачишь рух вперед, что вы сейчас делаете в, в этом направлении и, и взагалі, какое відчуття. Дякую. Дякую, Тимур. Вітаю, коллеги. Если можно презентацию, вимкнуть, будь ласка. Ну, я хотел бы начать свою ответ с Приблизно з того, що починав Овен свою презентацію, я декілька слів хотів би сказати про нашу біржу і чому ми тут, і чому саме на цій панелі. Перше, ми дійсно є ліцензійована біржа і знаходимось під регулюванням Національної комісії, яку, до речі, в мене буде чому дійсно подякувати, але трошки пізніше. Значит, на нашей бирже, мы фондовая биржа, и по згідно лицензии можем заниматься организацией торговли только ценных паперов, а также деривативов. Выходя из этого, это зумовало ту линейку инструментов, которые мы пропонували. Мы начали с ценных паперов, и в 2009 году начались торги на нашей бирже, а в 2010 году мы запустили строковый рынок. И, на жаль, не все знают, не только в нашей стране, а, возможно, даже в этом зале, что в Украине есть строковый рынок 
і з 2010 року є організована торгівля регулярна, і за цей час укладено вже, будь ласка, наступний цей неінформативний слайд. Ще один наступний слайд. За цей час було укладено вже більше 3 мільйонів 700 тисяч угод на цьому ринку, на строковому ринку, з сумою контрактів більше 500 мільярдів. Цей ринок дуже активно розвивався, особливо 10, 11, 12 рік. Ну, в принципі, тоді був розвиток і на фондовому ринку, активно розвивався, зростав ринок. В нас були інструменти тільки, деривативи тільки фондового ринку. Це фьючерс на наш індекс і опціон, відповідно, на наш фьючерс. І не дивлячись на це, ми досягали результатів, щоденні обсяги доходили до 26 мільйонів доларів. Це обсяг щоденний, ми виходили на такі значення. Зараз ми далекі від таких значень, але все-таки біржа могла проводити велику кількість операцій, і цей ринок розвивався, і за весь цей час не було ні одного дефолта, всі контракти були розраховані, і все, в принципі, ринок розвивався. З самого початку ми, звичайно, хотіли, щоб ринок деривативів був не тільки ринок деривативів фондового ринку, а й ринок деривативів і валютних, і товарних, звичайно. Ми зверталися до регуляторів за дозволом, щоб змогти організовувати торгівлю деривативами валютними і товарними, але, на жаль, ми отримували відмову стосовно такої можливості, і це все продовжувалось до 2015 року. В 2015 році нам дозволили запустити і деривативи валютного ринку, і перший дериватив товарного ринку – це був Дериватив – це був фьючерс на ціну нафти бренд, який ми запустили на нашій біржі, і він торгується, щоденно є обсяги торгів по цьому інструменту, і потихенько він розвивається. Але ми з самого початку, звичайно, хотіли і були націлені на аграрний ринок. Тому що Україна – велика аграрна країна з величезним потенціалом розвитку цього ринку, Кожен рік ми бачимо, що збільшуються урожаї, які збираються в Україні. І, як Тимур говорив, на жаль, ціноутворення українського на українську продукцію в Україні немає. Да, звичайно, орієнтири, як в особі Чикашської біржі, є, але ціноутворення немає. З моєї точки зору, Україна могла б стати регіональним центром ціноутворення Чорноморського басейну. І мета в нас така є саме – створити можливості, створити ліквідний ринок деривативів і стати центром ліквідності і в Україні, і в принципі у всьому регіоні Чорного моря. І ми почали рухатись до цього. І, звичайно, ми розглядали можливість запуску інструментів розрахункових, тому що до цього року наші всі інструменти були розрахункові. Ми мали бенчмарк, з якого брали ціну, по якій проводили виконання наших строкових контрактів. Але в Україні до останнього часу бенчмарку єдиного, якому всі довіряли по цінам на аграрну продукцію, не було. Так, звичайно, ми знаємо чекавську ціну, але по якій ціні наш товаровиробник може продати свою продукцію, таких цін є багато. Цей ринок існує, він дуже великий. Який плюс цього ринка, дуже великий плюс, це те, що на ринку дуже багато учасників. Дуже багато виробників, є великі виробники, але є середні і малі виробники. Великі виробники абсолютно легко хеджують свої ризики, в тому числі на Чикагській біржі. А от середні і малі виробники такої можливості не мають. Великі трейдери мають свої ціни і, в принципі, немає проблем дізнатись, по чому Нібулон сьогодні купує пшеницю. Інші трейдери по іншій ціні можуть купувати. Буває, що ціни для різних виробників відрізняються навіть в одного трейдера. Єдиного бенчмарку не було. І ми розуміли, що запустити розрахунковий контракт нам не вдасться, тому що бенчмарку немає. І ми вирішили створювати інструмент саме 
с поставками. И, будь ласка, слайд вимкніть, фьюч, а саме фьючерсний контракт з поставкою. Ми розуміли, що в нас є досить великий досвід, як для українського ринку, ринку деривативів. Ми розуміли, що ми знаємо, як організовувати торгівлю, ціноутворення, як проводити кліринг. Але поставочний інструмент відрізняється від розрахункових саме поставкою. А в цьому плані в нас не було досвіду. Ми почали працювати над цим, напрацювали певну модель, з якою пішли до нашого регулятора реєструвати нашу специфікацію. Саме на поставочний фьючерс. Я хотів би звернути увагу, що те, що ми зробили і те, що ми робимо, це підготовка до встановлення фьючерсного ринку в Україні. Це ще не, я не можу вам сказати, що є фьючерс аграрний, який працює і він там якусь ліквідність має. Ні, ми йдемо кроками певними до цього. Ми е, звернулися до учасників ринку за експертизою, як організувати поставку. На нашу пропозицію відкликнувся в першу чергу це е, Держрезерв, у якого є свої елеватори, і ми в партнерстві з Держрезервом розробили специфікацію першого контракту. Він досить простий, він, е, умови цього контракту були наступні. Є один елеватор, одна ціна, яка на цьому елеваторі торгується, і ми запустили такий фьючер. Розуміючи, що великої ліквідності там не може бути, але наша мета була саме знайти, я не знайти, а провірити нашу модель, як буде відбуватися поставка. Значить, е, будь ласка, наступний, наступний слайд. Тобто, е, як, в цій моделі що було дуже важливим? На біржі ліцензійовані можуть торгувати тільки брокери з ліцензії. Тобто, товаровиробнику чи е, трейдеру, який хоче купити зерно, потрібно йти до... Е, ліцензіата торгівця цінними паперами. Це незвично для учасників ринку зерна, звичайно. Укладати фьючерсний контракт, після цього виходити на виконання. І виконання ми заклали модель, що буде електронний договір поставки. Це також практика, яка вже є в Україні, але вона не, широкого, не отримала ще широкого такого застосування електронний договір поставки. Підписання з електронно-цифровим підписом цього договору. Ми е, перевірили цю модель, як вона працює. Ми допомагали тим учасникам, які е, були і уклали угоду, тому що угода була укладена на наш, нашій біржі. Пройшли розрахунки за цією угодою і, відповідно, е, продавець отримав гроші, а покупець отримав зерно. Це не були якісь е, уявні торги, це були торги з переходом права власності на товар, які відповідно підлягають оподаткуванню. І ми зрозуміли, що модель працююча, і ми перейшли до наступного кроку. Наступний крок і наступна наша мета – це запуск інструменту, в якого буде єдина ціна, але вже ціна не на одному елеваторі, а ціна Будь ласка, останній слайд поставте. А ціна на умовах CPT Одеса. До речі, в Одесі знаходимося і плани у нас саме, щоб торгували CPT Одеса. Ціна, але поставка може відбуватися на одному із пулу елеваторів, які будуть допущені до цього інструменту. І по результатам торгів, Ті компанії, які вийдуть на поставку, ціна в договорі поставки буде відповідно вираховуватись за формулою. А формула наступна – це ціна CPT Одеса плюс-мінус премія чи дисконт в залежності від того, де буде знаходитись елеватор. Тому що до Одеси, відповідно, з того елеватора потрібно цю пшеницю ще поставити. Тобто виконання контрактів буде здійснюватися не в Одесі, не обов'язково елеватор буде саме в Одесі, але єдина ціна, в залежності від місця поставки, ця ціна буде коригуватися відповідними преміями або дисконтами. Ми напрацювали цю специфікацію, я надіюся, що на наступному тижні ми вже підемо з цією специфікацією до регулятора,
і будемо відстоювати позицію, що таке має право на життя. Це вже про образ того ринку, який ми будемо будувати. Звичайно, коли ми зробили першу угоду, ми побачили ряд складностей, які існують на ринку. І відповідність, що таке складності? Це задачі. Задачі, які потрібно зробити. Ці задачі стосуються великого сектору. В тому числі і складські документи, які потрібно розвивати, і закон цей покращувати. Це, звичайно ж, і електронний договір, і практика електронного договору, яка повинна існувати. І, до прикладу, наступне питання. Наша податкова погано відноситься до договорів, де продавцем виступає не виробник. Якщо неможливо довести, що це виробник, є ризик не отримати відшкодування ПДВ. І ми на наступний наш етап, який ми зараз готуємо, ми будемо допускати, якщо податкова не змінить свого підходу, ми будемо допускати до виконання фьючерсних контрактів, саме до поставки, лише виробників зерна. Це, звичайно, обмежує коло учасників потенційних. Але ми розуміємо, що покупець повинен чітко розуміти, яка в нього вийде ціна і не мати ризику, чи буде відшкодовуватись ПДВ, чи не буде відшкодовуватись ПДВ. Тому ми пішли на обмеження, потенційне обмеження коло учасників, які виходять на поставку, для того, щоб зняти всякі ризики у покупців. Ми надіємося, що цей інструмент доведе свою ефективність. Ми дуже хочемо, щоб український аграрій і в першу чергу середній і малий аграрій отримали інструменти хеджування ризиків, зміни ціни. Ми не хочемо сказати, що все повинно продаватися лише через нашу біржу, лише через фьючерс. Це абсолютно так не буває, так не повинно бути. Ті компанії, яким необхідні гроші, вони продають майже з поля своє зерно, мабуть, вони так і будуть поступати. А ті компанії, які можуть своє зерно притримати і розглянути питання, продати його пізніше, вони будуть розглядати наш інструмент як можливість управління ризиком. Олег, дякую. Я буквально одне слово ще. Так, будь ласка. В Україні розвивається, я думаю, ми зараз і почуємо про це, аграрні розписки, до прикладу, і йде фінансування банків наших аграріїв, але банки отримають ризик неможливості управління зміною ціни у цього товару. І із-за того, що банк не може працювати з ризиком волатильності ціни зерна, банки вимушені вкладати досить серйозні дисконти в свої продукти, коли вони роблять аграрні розписки. Фьючерс дасть можливість управляти цим ризиком, відповідно зменшувати дисконтування в цих інструментах, відповідно робити більш привабливими ці інструменти для реального сектору. Тому я переконаний, що такі інструменти необхідні і ми зробимо і доб'ємось нашої мети. Дякую. Дякую, Олег. Дякую, що ви не втрачаєте час, ви шукаєте. А пошук – це дуже важливий елемент нашої реформаторської діяльності, і це, це дуже важливо. Важливо теж розуміння проблематики, тому що ми повинні для себе а, а, твердо сказати, що нам потрібно стійку систему взаємовідносин між а, а, виробниками, між фінансовими контрагентами встановити, для того, щоб ми а, не накопичували ризик, а, а його розподіляли. А, і це дуже важливо. Лео, ви, ви вже декілька років працюєте над аграрними розписками. Я теж знаю, ви дуже багатий опит і, і розчарувань, і, мабуть, певних позитивних елементів. Розкажіть, що, що зараз у нас з розписками, і як ми могли б все ж таки використати це на майбутнє. Ну і про проблеми теж, будь ласка. Okay. Thank you, thank you, uh, Timur. I'm going to stand because uh, я вибачаю, що я змінила слайди, що коли я хотіла там 
нові інформації, будь ласка, треба спитати. But I will do my presentation in English because English is better than Ukrainian and, and, and faster. Be, be cautious of time, please. Uh -huh. Okay? Be cautious of time. Yeah. Yes, time. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I'll go to the next slide. So my name is Leah Soroka and I'm with IFC. And our goal is to increase access to finance for agriculture, right? For farmers and uh, to, of course, have uh, financial intermediaries involved. Um, in our work, we have sort of two areas, and what was talked about today was working with banks and even input suppliers and others that provide credit in the market, and actually in today's market, more finance is provided by input suppliers, right? So we have some work there. We talked about risk, right? We want to spread the risk, and we work in agriculture insurance. So this is a very important instrument because if we do what Oleg says, is um, we want to cover uh, the risks. If, if the farmer has a contract for delivery, he has to guarantee that even in bad weather, he can deliver. And so agriculture insurance is an important instrument that will allow them to pay back their debt or fulfill delivery obligation. And of course, as Timor and others were mentioning, we have Agrani Rospiske or crop receipts. And crop receipts is basically another financial instrument it is called pre-season finance. Uh, whoever knows what is pre-season finance, I will buy them the beer. So let's just see, who knows? Oh, pre-season, Timur wins, Oleg C wins. You want the beer, but you have to give me the answer. What is it, pre-season? I should say, yeah, pre-season finance. Treba vi povidati, so, <laughs> so it is like, okay, so um, one of the things like what everyone says here is kind of true, right? In a crop receipt, what is interesting is I give you money and I plant the crop and at the end of the year, I pay you back in either money or crop, right? One or the other. Um, so I have a period of time. I have some risk, right? So I can use... Um, the ag insurance to uh, hedge that risk. And we see that there is a time delay. Well, this is the whole interesting thing with futures market. In futures market, what makes me stronger as a farmer is I have an idea what is the value of holding that crop and how much more money I can make. If I'm a banker, that's also interesting because that farmer's ability to pay at the spot price at harvest. And tell me, who knows what is the spot price at harvest? It's the same answer in every country. The lowest, right? It's the lowest. And so one thing we need to know is the spot price when things are trading. And that is often in Ukraine, the lowest price. So if we wanna have dynamic agriculture where farmers make more money, right? They have to know what is the future. If you wanna have investors or financiers finance agriculture, they need to know the future. And actually, Ukraine knows a bit of the future. Right? What is, um, actually, we, we know it because you know what is the biggest contract right now in Ukraine? Who knows the answer? Next beer. I'm waiting, come on, come on. Forward contract. You guys have no problem with the forward contract. In fact, the crop receipt is a forward contract. What is the difference between futures contract and forward? Huh, huh? Futures exchange Well, exchange, but what makes it special? Standard, yes. More special. Huh? Cash. You must pay or else. So I don't know if how much you know about me, but would you guess that I'm a farmer? So I have 3,000 hectares in Canada, and I had a very interesting thing. I'm a small, in the classification of small farmers, I'm on the bigger side. So I'm a small, big farmer. You can tell by my size. Yeah? So um, I'm a small, big farmer, and you know what happened to me in December is I had a futures contract for canola. So for Pericua Dachi, that's really raps. That's a special version of rapeseed. So um, I sold it on spot market at higher price, but I could not deliver. So guess what happens to me with a futures contract? Who knows what happened to me? Mama treba platete. I had to pay $1,200 to exit the contract. Okay? Guess what happened to ADM that bought my canola this spring? 
So in Canada, you may not know, but I could not finish the harvest. There was lots of snow and we could not finish. So before, in the spring, before I could seed, I had to combine. And when I combined that crop, we had what we call spring thresh, which is basically I combined in the, in the springtime and uh, there is chance for mycotoxin. So it's like fungus on there. They took a sample of my grain and they said, yes, Leah, we will take your grain. But when it came to delivery, you know what they said? Soroka, tamrojevi, there's a little bit of a pink stuff in there. I don't want it. And what did I say to them, like they told me in December? Pay me, but they took my grain. Okay, they took it. So you see the value of, we already do, future, we do forward contracts. You see the difference of doing a futures contract. So let's go back, where's my nice slides? Zahubilitu. Okay, nice, next one, because I have to go fast. So anyways, crop receipt. Crop receipt is this ability to do a forward contract with getting cash up front so you can seed, okay? So we have this element, a forward aspect, okay? In Brazil, we imitated this model from Brazil because the crop receipt provides 25 billion US dollars of working capital every year. The mechanism allows farmers to get access to that money. Oh yeah, right here. Oh, you, oh this is in English. Uh, where is the Ukrainian version? Okay, no, no problem. Plus another $40 billion of financing from other instruments. So it's an important instrument. And you know what? Brazil just recently also allowed a crop receipt to be a tradable security, okay? So what happens is I register my crop receipt and you can see, um, I won't give you all the advantages, but there's a register and you can watch it. And uh, you can see that no one else has a pledge against that same Rospiska. Um, so, uh, the, they just went to that you register the crop receipt as a crop receipt. And if it's a standard contract, guess what I can do with it? I can put it on the securities exchange. Okay, for the third beer, okay, what is the advantage of me being able to put this Ruspiska on the securities exchange? Aha, all of a sudden banks want to play. They said, Soraka, I don't want your grain, right? But now they're interested, why? Hey, I, get, I got a promise from her for 10,000 tons, ADM, Bungi, Cargill, who wants this? And you know what, Oleg has one, Oleg C has one, and so now all of a sudden, I can trade in another level. It provides this new market instrument and some new opportunities. So is this a good thing? Who's gonna buy me for beer? I think Robert Bond. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, Leah, oh. could you in one minute? Almost uh, done, oh, I'm great. almost done. You don't, you don't even have to don't remind take me. my beer away, okay? No more beer, well, who knows? We'll see if there's a surprise. So commodity and financial. So this is delivery and money, like we've all been talking about, Dali. I need my own command and control stick. Okay, so here, commodity exchange. This is a good thing. We can sell commodities. We can have other derivatives. This is very powerful. This is very cool. We need to know spot transactions. We already do forwards. You're close to a future. And this will stimulate development into each farmer owning their own squad. Okay, Dali? Okay. Um, so, like everyone said, trading volume is low, we need transparent pricing, we need better licensing and regulations, we need more derivatives, we need more products. Okay, next. Nastupni. Okay, Nastupni, uh, because this you can read yourself. Okay, Nastupni slide. I can't keep my minutes, you guys, if you don't. You can just tell us what's Okay, there. here. So this is my question, though. My question, why? Okay, I love these two guys. We didn't hear from Ken, but we heard from Owen. Commodity exchange, Duja class, right? It's cool. So why is it not working in the past? Six different projects in Ukraine, hard to make it work in its full form. Why? So who knows the answer to that? That could be too many beer. Actually, we already peg ourselves to international markets. Peg, not pig, peg. That means we benchmark already to international markets. Corn in Ukraine, guess what it's very close to? Chicago. Wheat, 
not so close to Chicago, but more European markets. Um, what else do we need besides just the elements of the market to make this work? Regulator. You, you need to do this. Regulator? The regulator? Yes, you need regulator I'm and the operational elements to implement and regulation. You, and you're, the, and you're uh, in my taking example. the time of a regulator. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, somebody took before me, so now I that agree. I have the mic, you have to take it away. Okay, now, stupny slide. Do I have Respect. any more? Motion on the stupny slide? It could be it. Ah, there we go. So, the question is, do we need something from scratch? Uh, now in today's internet market, do we need to just have parts of it? And even if we did what those two good looking guys said, would it work the seventh time in Ukraine? It's my question to you. Дякую. Дякую, Лео. На цій ноті я б дуже хотів, щоб ми трошки сіль посипали да, на цю комерційну, дуже successful story about futures contract, uh, crop receipts. Але я можу вам відповісти, да, чому 6, 7, 507 разів у нас не вийшло. Да. А, а, це факт і научний факт. Тільки в країнах, де є а, стійке а, і сильне регулювання цього ринку, а, які а, фактично підвергається uh, principal agent problem і суттєвої асиметрії інформації. Information is everything. А у нас information is nothing. Да, і, uh, і, на жаль, да, це те, що ми хочемо пояснити. Да, будучи регулятором, на жаль, це зараз наша, наш обов'язок змінити це і запровадити ті стандарти, які повинні бути, коли до вас приходять ваші учасники да, і вони починають торгувати. Ви не можете встановити ризик. Але ви повинні гарантувати, що буде розрахунок грошами, товаром і взагалі щось відбудеться. Тому а, а, хочу представити Кевіна а, і а, All time is yours. You can take whatever. I'll make sure we close the doors before you finish. А, а, чому це, це важливо? Кевін вже другий раз в Одесі. А, я, я впевнений, що буде і третій, і четвертий, і п'ятий. А, але а, CFTC у нас дуже, а, дуже стійкі відносини, і а, ми розуміємося на проблемах, вони розуміють проблеми наші, як регулятори. Чому ми не відбулися, а інші ринки відбувалися. Тому, please, Kevin, uh, what's your view? Thank you. Right? Well, thank you. Well, I think the first thing and the most important thing for any U.S. regulator, if I can have my slides up, is, is my disclaimer. So these are my comments, my comments only, and not that of the staff, the commissioner, or the commissioner. So now that we got that over with, I can now talk commodities. And I, I think the one lesson we learned is probably the most important part of being a regulator is having enforcement. So everyone ends on time, right? So you need an enforcement level. But uh, you know, I, I have had the pleasure of working with Timur for a little over a year now and his colleagues. And I am convinced that an effective, active futures market will be a tremendous boon. Uh, agriculture energy is so important to the economy here. Adding an effective futures market will only increase that. It will give better price transparency. It will give better risk management to the farmers, to the end users. And uh, the best thing is you got a terrific foundation in what uh, the gentleman over here were talking about before with the energy exchange, Ukraine energy exchange, the Ukraine exchange. The foundation is there, the, the agricultural receipts. It's there. We now need to build off of it. So. With that, okay, so now I'm gonna be challenged because that's just Ukrainian. So I gotta go for my notes and I'll, uh, <laughs> you guys have the slide deck. Uh, it was in the packages, hopefully you all have one. You can just sort of follow along as I go along. Um, but, uh, I, you know, the purpose of an exchange, I think as was talked about, is fairness, fairness, price transparency. I mean, that's the key. Right now, you got an effective forward market, you got an effective spot market, that's great, you know, but I think as Owen talked about with the benchmark, it's the pricing now. How do you do that? How do you enable it so that small farmers, large farmers, the, you know, everyone involved in the process, the hedgers, the speculators, right? Speculators are an incredibly important part of the market. They provide the liquidity. You know, it's one thing to have two parties on either side bidding on, on, on delivery, but to have a speculator in there, they're gonna keep them all honest. You know, because that guy, they, that person's in there only for the profit. He's just in there for the spread. He wants volatility. He's going to respond very quickly, or she, very quickly to, to weather events, to 
things happening around the world, whether they're geopolitical or whatever, that speculator is going to be there and really help drive that price and keep it so that it is the best price available. Um, so it, it's critical, and that's what a futures market really helps do. So the question is, how do you create a futures market? Um, I wish that was an easy answer. It's not. It involves a number of players. It involves the exchanges. It involves industry. It involves clearinghouses. It involves the end users, the producers, you know, the farmers, the gas companies, the oil companies. Uh, all have to get together. Uh, and I should say the regulator, of course. Sorry, Tamar. Uh, <laughs> always an important you part. Right? I, you know, you got, you, regulators are always afterthoughts, right? I spent 35 years on Wall Street, and, uh, you know, it's just like, oh, the regulators are coming out. Damn. You know, now what do we do? Um, but uh, the regulators are very important, obviously. Uh, but it is a team. Everyone has to work together. You can't do it in isolation. The regulator can't come in and say, okay, you know, Ukraine Energy Exchange, here are your rules, go to it, have fun, let me know how you make out. That's just not how it is. You know, the exchange can't just come to the regulator and say, okay, here's how it's done. It says, they were talking, you, know, you reach out to the industry, you reach out to the participants, and you say, what do you want, right? So, you know, first and foremost, contract design is critical, right? And it is a design that, of a contract, and it's not necessarily deliverable in the U.S., and there are 10,000 contracts that are registered, right? Out of that, about 3% are traded once a week. And less than 1% are even traded actively. And I will also say that less than 3% actually take delivery on. So the futures market in the U.S. is there as a risk management tool. Not necessarily a delivery tool. Can be, absolutely. But it's there primarily as risk management. And that's what really helps, because it helps the producers, it helps the farmers, it helps everyone involved make sure they're, they're managing their risk and they're getting the best price that they can. So uh, one of the other things that you need is effective delivery. I'm so, oh, there it is. I'm sorry. I got my English. So now I don't have to talk to my notes. My apologies. Um, so contract design we talked about, tradability contracts, supporting data. So you need the data. You need to understand what the supply is, what the demand is, what the forecast is, what projections are. And it's going to vary contract by contract. But you need to know that. And it's got to be transparent to the entire market. It can't just be the big producers that know this stuff. Well, yeah, they'd love to know it. And they probably do know it because they've got a pretty good handle on the market. But everyone needs to have this data. And it doesn't matter if it comes from the Ministry of Agriculture, from Energy, from a third party. As long as it's good data, reliable data that people can trade on, that's what you need. Um, delivery mechanism, quality control, location, right? Port of Odessa, right? Great location. Uh, cost of delivery, obviously critical things for the delivery. Let's see if I can get this. Here we go. Um, arbitration process. Things do go wrong, right? You don't like it, but they do go wrong. You want to make sure that arbitration process is fair to everyone involved, right? From the small farmer, the small retail person that would be doing a trade to the large producer. Um, financing by banks. The banks need to be involved. Help with the margin, right? Futures contracts is based on margin. And in order to get effective margin, you need good pricing, you need good transparency, right? Margin is also a risk management tool. In a very volatile market, margin's gonna go up. What does that do? That helps ensure that at the end of the day, you're gonna get paid. Futures in the clearinghouse takes away a significant amount of the credit risk. Yeah, maybe you have a little clearinghouse credit risk, but you don't have counterparty credit risk. You know, forward contracts are terrific, counterparty credit risk. Futures, you don't really have that, right? It's just a little. But by having effective margining, the banks will come in because I think as Leah said, you know, you've, you've got something at the banks, they understand. They can hold a piece of paper, a receipt, and say, okay, I get it. I, I, I understand what this is. And banks are very good at evaluating credit. That's all it is, just a different evaluation of credit. Um, so, others, speculators. What else do you need? You need regulators. You really do. Um, but the key is you need regulators. You don't need over-regulation. Right? And that's one of the problems we have in the U.S. I mean, the U.S. commodity markets, as Owen said, oldest in the world. It was like 180 years old. I mean, it, it's, it's incredibly old. Um, they were sleepy for so, so long. Right? I mean, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, we were just the ugly stepdaughter of the SEC. You know, you say the CFTC is coming in. People say, who's that? 
I don't know. I, they come in, they do something with futures, whatever they are. Uh, now, you know, we oversee a $30 trillion market, right? The largest market in the world, CFTC oversees. Now, I will say our budget is one quarter the size of the SEC, but that's a different issue that we're fighting with Congress. Um, and we're woefully understaffed, but everyone is, right? Uh, but what our job is, is to make sure that the markets are fair and transparent and that customers are protected. I, I'm, I used to be in charge of our examination program, oversaw all the banks, the exchanges, uh, the, the broker dealers. Um, and I would walk in in a troubled institution and I would go sit down with the board and say, I really don't care if you go bankrupt. I sort of did, but I didn't want to tell them that. Took away the element. But I do care if one customer loses one dollar. That's my concern. Customer protection, role of the regulator. So price transparency, risk management, um, making sure the markets are fair and transparent, and protecting customers. Um, so what do the regulators do? Uh, contract design, critical. Are we supposed to be in charge of the economics? Do we want to make sure that contract is profitable, that our friends over here are going to make a lot of money? We hope you do. Uh, you know, we're going to look at liquidity of the contract. What's the need of the contract? You know, at the CFTC, our job is easy. You guys do all the work. You come to us with a contract. You do your homework. We tell you what the principles are. So our regulation is very principle-based. We say, here, here is what you need to do. If you follow these principles, and what are the principles? No one person can manipulate the contract. So it's not a contract designed just for ADM. So they can manipulate the price and make a ton of money. All right? It's got to be a contract that has liquidity, that the industry wants. So we're going to expect when that contract comes to us that we're going to see the industry analysis, that they met with the industry, they met with users, with the producers, with the speculators, we, they met with everyone, and this is what they decided. The quality control, how can you ensure that what is being traded is in fact deliverable? Now, it doesn't have to be delivered, but you have to have the threat of delivery in order to make an effective futures contract. So, and, and by the way, our regulation, we don't approve a contract. We just don't disapprove it. So I guess that's probably too many lawyers in Washington came up with that one. Um, so yeah, our job, you know, it, it's, it's the exchange's job to make sure it works. If it doesn't work, it's the exchange's job to come up with revisions. Maybe it's a delivery issue, right? Maybe it's a quality issue. Great, you guys come up with a solution. Now, if they don't, yeah, we're gonna call them up and say, hey, what's going on? It looks like when this futures contract comes to maturity, right, what we call conversion, where the, the spot and futures market uh, coincide, if that pricing is not close, we consider it between one to 3% close, depending on the contract. Um, so if, if on delivery date, the futures price and the spot price aren't within one to 3%, we'll call up our friends at the CME and say, so what's happening here? What's going on? How come this is not converging? Is there a problem with the contract? And then we expect CME to fix it. Uh, but it is a very uh, informal relationship. It can be very formal, as our friends at the CME know sometimes. Uh, if they don't listen, yeah, we take out the hammer and hit them over the head and say, come on, guys, you got you to do this. Uh, but 99%, it's a phone call. It's a conversation. What's going on, right? So let me see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. Um, oh, they're overseeing the markets. So we do delegate a lot of our regulatory oversight to the CME and the NFA, the National Futures Association. Uh, the difference between the two, CME basically takes care of all of the clearing brokers and the exchanges. NFA deals with the swap markets um, and the introducing brokers, so basically the smaller brokers. Um, and then our job is to oversee the CME and the NFA. So we'll come in and make sure they're doing their job overseeing the market. So it's an industry-led oversight. So and this helps make sure we're not over-regulating because the industry comes up with the rules. CME comes up with the rules. They send us a rule. They say, hey, we would like to do this new rule. What do you think? And we look at our, our legislation, because it's, it's all based in law. It's called the Commodity Exchange Act. And we say, does this jive with the Commodity Exchange Act? If it does, great, go at it, have fun. 
um, you know, we'll have a lot of conversations. We'll go back and forth. We'll, we'll do it. But we also have 10 days to approve or, or to not approve, right? Because we don't approve anything. We, you know, to not disapprove, right? There you go. Yeah, again, lawyers, right? You can't say, yes, it's okay. No, no you get in trouble if you say yes. So you can only say, you know, that uh, we're not going to disapprove it. But we have 10 days. If we don't do it in 10 days, go at it. It's yours. Um, so that also helps make sure it's a fluid, fast-moving environment. I mean, these futures markets, as these gentlemen know and, and Leah, um, they are extremely fast-moving. They're extremely volatile. Right? When I started, I had a full head of hair. Right? You pull your hair out. <laughs> it goes crazy. Um, market surveillance, another critical thing. And this is one of the things that uh, we do really, really well. We have a number of ex-traders that just sit there all day watching the market. We get every single trade from every exchange around the world that we regulate, that, that's involved in our markets, the US markets, and we look at that data. We have the ability to look at a trade. We know the firm, we know the trading desk, we know the trader, we know the customer, we know whether it's a hedge trade or a speculative trade. We know by nanosecond exactly what's happening in the market. You know, and I, I wish I could show you some of the, the analysis that these guys do, it's just terrific. And they will know that if, if this firm is usually always long and then all of a sudden they go short for two seconds, and then they're long again, guess what? They're gonna get a phone call saying, well, what happened? What's going on, all right? Most of the time it's legitimate, but some of the times it's not. And that's where you see the enforcement action. But market surveillance oversight is critical. Now CME does the same thing. They have a market oversight function. Why are we duplicating it? It's so important. How can we not? Right? There are certain things we have to be a little inefficient, and this is one, because pricing, transparency, fairness, right? that's the bottom line for a regulator. Uh, key regulation, I'll go through this quickly. You can read through it. Um, segregation, protection of customer assets. So assets of customers are locked up, they're separate, and they're secure. Now, all of these other things, they sort of came in after what, 2011, after MF Global. Prior to MF Global, we had the belief, well, if customer assets are locked up, right, they're held separate in a separate bank account, no one can touch it, it's only for the exclusive benefit of customers. We always said, that's great, we have nothing to worry about. Then MF Global happened, guess what? Customers almost lost a ton of money, right? Peregrine happened, fraud. Customers almost lost money, in that case they did. So we came up with more rules, the key being risk management. We require the firms to risk manage. We require customers to risk manage. They've got to have effective risk management processes and systems. So that's probably the most important thing that we've changed recently. Oversight enforcement, right? Uh, three levels. First time's a warning, slap on the wrist, maybe a fine, and then if they're really bad, we'll shut you down. And there are quite a few that we've shut down. Uh, and that's me, so. Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, could you, well, could you just give me a very short uh, answer, straightforward one? Uh, 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 for Kevin, it will be the next question. We have such wonderful opportunities, but why does this not happen? And I think we need to understand, can we do this without regulation? You know what we have now. You know where Ukraine is. Ukraine is now one of the 10 countries in the world that does not have regulation of the financial sector, not the bank sector. The other nine, I won't call you. But there is no one European country. We today understand clearly, we did a consultation with EOSCA and CFTC, a very important and active member of our organization. Can we do this without EOSCA? Can we reach that level? when I'll call you and say, listen, Kevin, could you register one of the exchanges as a foreign border trade? It well, that's a good amount of cosmos. No, for sure. I would like to call our colleagues in Washington and ask, can we now our international trade platform, Desku or Kaksku, register as a foreign trade trade? Very many countries want to do that. Хотіли б ми, це буде, мабуть, запитання, але можемо взагалі це відбутися, якщо ми не виконаємо ЄОСК? So that was a long way of saying, can you do this? Well, yeah. The short answer, without regulation, the short answer is absolutely not. 
Um, you know, our markets have proved it. All right, for a long time, you know, the swap market, unregulated, right? What happened? 2008, right? An unregulated market took down the world. The swap market took down the world, right? So what happens? Well, typical Washington regulator reaction is you put in regulation. Um, you know, we're not there in the futures side. Futures markets existed for a long time, but regulation creates fair, transparent markets, good pricing, so that banks will lend against it, investors will invest in it. An investor wants to know that a regulator is there so that they know when they're buying or they're selling, they're involved in the futures contract, a forward or a spot, that the regulator is overlooking it. We're not a guarantee. You know, we make mistakes too. But by having effective regulation gives confidence in the market. You do not have a market without confidence of investors. And IOSCO, a lot of the things they recommend are, are very sound, very reasonable. Um, you have to adopt it to your markets. Uh, it, as I said before, you've, you've got a terrific foundation already. Build on it. But do it in a regulated environment, and that's where investors will come in. They're not going to come in. Speculators will not come in unless you, you have that. Thank you. У нас є ще час для запитань. Це успіх для наших панелістів. Дякую вам, що надали можливість. Друзі, якщо є якісь запитання до наших панелістів, то буде дуже цікаво. Будь ласка. Дмитро. Owen, I have a question to you. Um, are you familiar with, the, obviously, your story in Malaysia? Yeah. Yeah. If, could you please explain to us what was the magic that worked what happened that Malaysian, when they tried to put together the palm oil market, and it was very small and barely functioning. And what happened when CME came in? I mean, what made the difference? What, what made that story a success? Because you read about it a lot, but it would be interesting to hear about it from the exchange point of view. And you know, what are the receipts, yeah. what are the receipts for success? That's a, great, that's a great example. So Malaysia, very similar, uh, has a currency that isn't as easily accessed internationally, very strong in one specific sector, which is palm oil. And they had their own local exchange, Bursa Malaysia. So what we did with Bursa was we split their derivatives business from their cash business. And then we took an equity stake in their derivatives business as CME Group. We then took their contract, which was already okay. It was used by local uh, consumers and producers, but it wasn't a benchmark. And we moved it to the CME trading system. So suddenly, every agriculture and the trader in the world that had access to CME also had access to Malaysia. So we took the market from being a very small, secretive, local market that was hard to understand into the desktop of everybody that was already trading wheat and corn and soybeans with us. And then because it was in the same place, people could more easily trade soybean oil, bean oil versus, or gas oil versus palm oil. So spreads started to emerge. Now, from a regulatory perspective, it has zero implication because we take the trade on the screen, we give it back to the local exchange, and the local exchange clears it, and the market surveillance takes place in Malaysia, the regulation is in Malaysia. So all we are is the facilitator, the window to the world. But as a result of that, their volumes went up maybe 10 times. So it worked for everybody. Да, це дуже важливо, тому що Малайзія залишила за себе право формувати вартість своєї продукції. Це дуже, дуже знаково. А буде ще якесь це питання? Ні? Ну, давайте я тоді, у нас ще 5, 5 хвилин є. Я вам обіцяв, що я не дозволю нікому виходити. Друзі, у нас за цей рік, да, і ми вже так звикли, вимірювати цей наш час. Ну, от, наприклад, конференціями в Одесі. Да. В минулому році ми дуже багато спілкувалися щодо наших повноважень, там, закону про деривативів. Ну, ми, ми розуміємо, що вже вони так всі відійшли в історію. Да. Ми вже 
маємо наші законопроекти щодо повноважень, щодо ринку деривативів, щодо імітентів. У нас є три пріоритети на цей рік. І ми вже розглядаємо, і я хочу в цей момент подякувати нашим партнерам з USAID і програмі фінансової трансформації за підтримку нашим партнерам із BRD. Ми працюємо над законами, які нададуть нам прискорити цей рух. Це, по-перше, закони, які повністю імплементують питання інфраструктури. Це пост-трейд до рівня євродиректив. Ми теж плануємо вирішити питання складських свідоцтв, розписок, для того, щоб невілювати цей дисонанс, який зараз є. Нам потрібно формувати гарантийний фонд для забезпечення виконання зобов'язань за складськими свідоцтвами. Ми вже досягли певних домовленостей з Національним банком щодо нагляду за клірінговими інститутами і за депозитарною системою. Це ми готуємо, це один. Друге питання, тобто інфраструктура і інструмент. Ці два питання для нас будуть в наступний такий сезон, до наступного кінця літ, до наступного вересня 2018 року, дуже нагайними. Це щодо законодавства. Ну і по-друге, це імплементація. Ми не чекаємо, поки закони ці будуть прийняті. Ми вже дуже багато чого робимо. У нас і в національному депозитарі йдуть зміни, в розрахунковому центрі. Ринок вже змінюється. У нас у минуле відходять ці операції з мусором. Розумієте, перейти з ринку, який повністю застосував себе для вирішення питань оптимізації фіскальних моментів, shadow banking, де й взагалі інші не дуже приємних речей, до ринку, який буде сприяти формуванню капіталу і забезпечувати це поєднання спекулянтів, виробників і забезпечити прозоре та чесне співвідношення, це для нас ще два роки тому було неможливо. Але ми зараз розуміємо, що тільки наполегливість і підтримка вас, спільна мова, вона надасть нам можливість досягати результатів і зробити нашу місію «Impossible» very possible. Окей? Тобто, да. А, Вікторія, будь ласка, у тебе є запитання. Так, звичайно. Давай, у тебе теж була місія «Impossible». Yes, mission was impossible. Я маю таке питання. Вважаючи, що минулого року я також, як і ти, була модератором цієї сесії, ми також говорили про деривативи, тому в мене, мабуть, таке питання, яке буде прологом до наступного Ukrainian Financial Forum 2018. Тимура, як ти, як голова комісії, як наші колеги, які допомагають нам розвинути законодавство, а також практичні інструменти, і безпосередньо дві біржі, як ви вважаєте, яких інструментів зараз немає, але вони можуть з'явитися за один рік, так, щоб наступного року вже була success story, Додатково, що ми запустили якийсь інструмент. Я вважаю, що це може бути таким дороговказом і для комісії, і для учасників ринку виконати цю обіцянку. От який у вас прогноз? Я вважаю, що ми могли розвивати надалі і фьючерсний інструментарій, але ми теж розуміємо, що там функціонал дуже обмежений. Нам потрібно в наступному році вирішити питання інструмента поставки. І це буде залишатись питанням по розпискам, тому що це борговий інструмент, ніж все ж таки інструмент поставки. Тому складські свідоцтва і питання все ж таки торгів розписками це може бути. Але ми ще маємо боргові інструменти, це корпоративні облігації, і ми розраховуємо на них теж. Так, будь ласка. If you decide finally to enter to the market to acquire a stake in any of the stock exchanges, what would be your requirements, at least three, for that? So, 
We have a variety of models. Uh, we have a lot of partners around the world, uh, partner exchanges, and we have a variety of models. So Dubai, where I worked, uh, CME owns the majority stake. It appoints the management, and trading and clearing takes place on CME. Malaysia, I talked about, trading takes place. We have a 25% stake. There's other markets where we host the nighttime session. So for example, you guys are working during the day in Ukraine, but overnight, if people want to trade it, it moves to the Chicago. So it's not necessarily that there's any one model of partnership. We have lots of different models from equity stakes and equity control down to just technology provider. So it, it's, hard to, it's hard to give you one answer, but there's a menu of options for us that we look at. And if I can just add, in all due respect to my friends at CME, there's also ICE, LCH. There are a lot of other exchanges that would no, I haven't come love across to those come guys. in here. I'm sorry. I know you can. I know you're tough. I know you can get them. But I, just in fairness, Ukraine is in a great position. Everyone knows how important you are to the agriculture and energy markets. And you structure this thing properly. And I, I think you'll have a lot of people that want to partner with you. Ми ми дуже активно спілкувалися і працюємо з CME щодо нашого законопроекту 70-55 по регульованим ринкам. Вони його чекають, да, і нам потрібно дати регулювання товарним біржам на тому ж рівні, який відповідає міжнародним стандартам. Зараз, ну, якщо на, на чистоту, ну, на жаль, жодна наша біржа, да, при всій повагі, не, не може бути розглядатися як, як об'єкт входження. Фактично нас чекають системні зміни, да, і тому, ну, маючи таке попереду, ну, жодний інвестор буде думати про те, так хто ж все ж таки з українських майданчиків да, фінішує від цього моменту. Тому і, і не забувайте про історію. Due diligence. З нашим минулим яскравим у нас є запитання. Да, якщо бути чесним, один до одного. Тому а, давайте все ж, все ж таки розглядати а, оптимістично майбутнє. Да? Нам потрібні безумовні закони і наполегливість в впровадженні того, що ми можемо зробити нашим населенням. І завдяки вам ми а, будемо триматися да? разом і рухатися вперед. Якщо ще щось, ні? ви теж хочете сказати? Тимур, у мене є питання. Давай, Олексій. Я хотел бы наших коллег спросить и по поводу стимулирования биржевой торговли. Понятное дело, Америка это развитой рынок, но вот и как из неразвитых рынков да, стать более развитым? Должно ли государство как-то мотивировать им участников к приходу на биржу? И если должно, то как? So, um, can I take, can I start? Um, one of the so the first thing is that the futures industry has a pretty terrible record of launching successful products it's just the nature of what we do is that one in nine futures products succeeds typically you know, uh, at CME we have a better record we have maybe four in ten but still typically you have a lot of failures in the futures market uh, because you ask trader, would you like this product? He always says yes, because it's a free option. No trader, no. Why? We're doing the work, so the trader will always say yes, so we will always launch. So there's an inevitable failure rate in futures. So don't think that the US has all the answers because we still fail more contracts than we succeed, even after 150 years. I think where the government can help is not in intervening in the markets, but one of the things that really works is using uh, settlement commodity prices benchmarks as a tax reference point. That's really a successful way of stimulating interest. So if you think about Brent in the oil market, so a good example, Brent failed three times before it succeeded. So don't be pessimistic when you're on your sixth or seventh launch. Uh, what may bring they're, wow they're, they're serious guys <laughs> we better finish but i think i think the response is, is clear alexey uh важливо не заважати 
Да. Дякую. Я бажаю ще. 30 секунд на від. Um, because it is the industry regulating the industry, so the fox watching the hen house. Um, but that's where the regulator has to oversee the process. But it, it can definitely work. Uh, but you need the right people and in discipline, yeah. I, it, but it's, it, it can work, but just got to be, you know, they got to know you're looking over their shoulders. <laughs> Нас, нас більше не запросять сюди. Ну да, я, я пропоную. Да. Я також хотів би задати питання. І моє питання в першу чергу для Кевіна. Е, я недавно читав, перечитував інтерв'ю Артура Лафера, який був е, в свій час радником е, міністра фінансів України. І він сказав такі слова. Україна на сьогоднішній день бідна країна. І ви, якщо ви хочете рухатись вперед і ставати багатими, ви повинні в першу чергу дивитися на багаті країни 100-150 років назад, коли вони були бідними і робили кроки, щоб стати багатими. Кроки, які роблять багаті країни зараз, не факт, що підходять бідним країнам. І от е, в виступу Кевіна я почув також, що перерегулювання також може бути шкідливим. Я, чи, можливо, я неправильно зрозумів. І в мене таке питання. А, Кевін, якщо нинішнє регулювання, яке є зараз в Сполучених Штатах, е, взяти і повернутися на 100, більше 100 років назад і прийти на Чикагську біржу, і поставити там таке регулювання, як зараз, чи розвивалась би біржа Чикагська так швидко і так гарно, як вона розвивалась весь цей час? So, okay, I, I think it's a great question. Um, but I would say the markets 100 years ago, the markets 25 years ago weren't even close to where they are today. I mean, it's Today, it is, your, well, I should say 25 years ago, you came into the pit at 8 in the morning, you left at 3 in the afternoon, you were done. As long as your, your book balanced, you walked away, you went to the bar, you had some drinks, uh, that was it. Today, it's 24-7 trading. I mean, the market does not sleep. Something that happens in Asia, I, you know it's impacting the overnight markets in the U.S. These are 24-hour-a-day markets. The regulation that existed back in the 1800s, yeah, it probably was very light, but we've learned a lot of lessons. We've made a lot of mistakes. Um, I think today we have an extremely effective regulatory environment for the derivatives industry, commodities, forwards, over-the-counter trading, um, that's well thought through because I think we do have a lot of people where we are reaching out to industry. And industry is not shy, as you guys know, right? If they don't like something, they're gonna come back to you and say, you guys are idiots. What are you thinking? This doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, we say, you're right. We change it. But if you look at the principles, at what are there in the regulations, I think those principles are, you know, the right for today's market. Um, so, yeah, you don't want to over-regulate. You don't want to just 
throw on rules for the sake of putting on a rule that someone sneezes in, in Asia, so you force the people in the United States to take flu shots. I, you know, it, it shouldn't be that way. It should be thoughtful. All right, someone sneezed. Okay, fine. You know, is that the end of the world? No. Do we need regulation? No. So it's got to be thoughtful regulation. And that, that's what I meant by not over-regulating, just making sure, because the industry has to be successful. You know, we can't stifle industry. We can't stifle competition. I, yeah, we're not in the business of helping you guys make money, but we are in the business of making sure that markets are there for investors to do risk management. And they can only do that if, it, if it's an effective market. Олег, ми іншим, іншими словами, я вважаю, да, ми теж повинні розуміти з іншого кута. А, якщо б у нас була дуже а, успішна індустрія, безумовно, давайте, а, ми могли б щось пом'якшувати да, і розмовляти про це, але наша індустрія не досягла а, будь-якого результату, який би сприяв економічному зростанню країни і збагатінню націй. Цього не відбувається. Тому питання, давайте пом'якшимо регуляцію і надамо можливість розвитку, Кевін сказав, we are not here for intermediaries, we are here for investors. Да? Ми тут для інвестора, щоб він а, не був інструментом в руках а, а, торговців, в руках будь-кого, да? і його інтереси не, не були забуті. І тому ми, а, ми про це говоримо. Індустрія не може uh, пробачити на костелях да, і, і йти до успіху. Нам потрібні правила. І ми тільки говоримо про правила. Зараз uh, overregulation, ну, безумовно, у нас overregulation в процесі реєстрації акцій. Це безумовно. Там у нас ринка акцій немає. Безумовно, там потрібно дуже багато чого скорочувати. Але інші регуляторні моменти, які потрібні, які вже є в світі, uh, да, для того, щоб стати частиною цього світу, нам потрібно цю рівновагу. А потім вже ми могли б говорити. Дякую. Uh, once again, дякую всім. Ну і побачимось на барикадах.
Okay, guys, shall we uh, try and make a start, if possible? Guys at the back. Um, okay, well, uh, it's, it's quite late in the afternoon and uh, I'm feeling a little bit jaded, I have to say, after a very long but very productive day. Um, so I thought I would slightly change uh, the format a little bit of this session to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, but basically, this is the, the panel of the brains, I guess. I mean, we've got all the analysts lined up here. We've got uh, uh, three cell site analysts. I'm looking where you are. Vladimir, Alina, uh, Sergey. Uh, three bank analysts from Nomura, uh, Morgan Stanley and Bamel. Uh, at the end, we've got Andre Schneider from IIF, so representing, I guess, uh, I was going to say, well, institutional more. Uh, and uh, we've also got Vladislav Shushko from BIS, Bank for International Settlements, as well. So kind of a European institutional uh, perspective. And then we've got Chris Miller, who uh, we're you know, very pleased is with us also, who is a historian, academic, and also journalist who tweets quite prolific prolifically on, on the region. So I think we've probably got all bases covered. Uh, and, and as you probably know, I'm Tim Ash. I'm a uh, also was an analyst for 20 years, doing the job that these three people do, uh, covering Ukraine, etc. But now I'm on the buy side, so now I'm an investor. So to make it slightly different and more slightly interesting, what I thought I would do is ask our three sell side analysts uh, to pitch to me, which is a little bit strange. But but you know, what is the story that you're selling to your institutional investor base about what you should do in Ukraine? You know, what are, what are the pluses, minuses, you know, and, but ultimately, you know, is it a, a buy, sell, hold? You know, it's very interesting on the back of the, you know, we did the three, well, we, Ukraine did the three billion euro bond deal. Uh, you know, I guess you three all had a view on that. Uh, it, but basically, what is the story that you're selling to, to people like myself who make big decisions about whether or not we, we invest in Ukraine? So, so on that note, let, let's start with Sergey. First up. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Okay, yes. Tim, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, well, I mean, it's the continuation of the uh, theme that we had in the uh, previous panel in a larger room, where the glass is uh, half full or half empty. I would say that on the, uh, the macroeconomic uh, stability, at least in the near term, uh, it, it's definitely uh, half full, uh, in, in, in my view. I've had some uh, meetings in, in Kiev before uh, coming here. Uh, and um, Ukraine seems to be enjoying uh, sort of, uh, a nice uh, period when, of course, global markets are extremely supportive. Uh, they had a very successful placement uh, of um, and new securities extended the curve, uh, dealt with the front uh, you know, concentration uh, of, of the uh, redemptions at the front. Uh, and and uh, according to uh, published comments from the minister, are considering uh, doing more uh, going forward. So clearly uh, there is very strong uh, technical uh, support uh, for Ukrainian assets, uh, especially given that despite sort of the somewhat unexpected uh, details of Fed announcements last night, we're still in an environment where sort of any um, high-yielding emerging market sovereign with a, a positive credit trajectory uh, is in high demand, and that's exactly what uh, Ukraine is uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, but people following Ukraine over time uh, would clearly notice that uh, it is prone to um, cycles and, and political cycles are extremely important because it's a very open uh, place uh, politically. Um, so the window uh, for advancing reforms is not wide. I would say whatever is not done by middle of next year is probably not going to be done through the end of the election cycle at some point in uh, 2019. And again, as we all um, heard earlier today, uh, there are glaring sort of, uh, issues uh, on the structural uh, reform side. 
Um, of course, land reform is the most important uh, move going forward in order to uh, improve uh, productivity in a key sector, uh, agriculture. But other reforms, uh, including issues to enhance governance, governance, which is, of course, directly related to the uh, proposed um, uh, anti-corruption uh, court and, and other measures. We heard uh, earlier today that the government is advocating, hopefully, alongside and not as an alternative, uh, creation of uh, a financial watchdog or some sort of an entity that would look uh, closely into uh, sort of irregularities through financial uh, means. Uh, and, you know, th we have to watch it very closely then because Ukraine was meant to get uh, a two billion dollar tranche uh, before the end of the year. Now we have some concerns about the timing of the tranche because clearly IMF is having um, a second thought about the commitments that were made earlier, including on gas tariff adjustment. And frankly speaking, getting a second tranche uh, after that uh, doesn't appear particularly likely. So I would say that Ukraine is still a buy. You have to be selective kind of in terms of assets. You have to look at the curve. Uh, probably if, uh, you know, if global risk appetite may start waning at some point, then the longer dated um, securities look a bit more vulnerable to potential correction. Also, if there is more liability management going forward, then I think Ukraine will continue issuing into the long end uh, of the curve. Uh, and in terms of warrants, uh, you know, it's, it's a function of many uh, factors. The exchange rate trajectory has changed. The growth figures are not bad, uh, but not sufficient to generate uh, even the you know, the sort of variations that would uh, justify the uh, kind of high 50s um, uh, sort of prices. Clearly, there should be a much more um, sustained pickup in growth uh, and based on both reform and macroeconomic stabilization uh, to get into levels that some other people in the industry uh, consider warranted. So it's a buy, but I would say it's a cautious buy. At some point, it will become a speculative, speculative uh, bet, and I would say closer to end of the year, maybe beginning of the year, when we should expect decisions on what exactly um, the, the appeal on the Russian uh, $3 billion uh, bond would, uh, would come uh, up with, uh, I would probably take some risk off the table. So uh, it's come a long way in a short period of time. I mean, yields have really collapsed over the last six months but you still see value and a bit of momentum behind it, would you say? Yes, because it's not easy to find uh, a credit, uh, another credit in, in the time zone, which still maintains the, the, the positive momentum and offers the yields comparative to, to Ukraine, okay. regardless okay. of the ratings, which still are low. I mean, the CAA rating you know, from Moody's is, is a big impediment. I mean, some clients cannot even touch uh, Ukrainian assets, if they are continue to be uh, rated in, in triple C category, at least by one agency. So it's important that you know the government and the bank continue to work, you know, along the reform and stabilization programs, and, and of course with the with the rating agencies, so that the re-rating uh, continues. Alina, what, what's your pitch to a bond investor? Uh, sure. So um, we've been bullish Ukraine all like throughout the year and. Uh, the performance was great, probably even better than we thought. Um, yeah, after just, you know, recent amazing, uh, you know, performance in the market, we turned neutral. Um, yeah, just because of, uh, not because of lack of visibility, but uh, yeah, it's just based on the previous performance and we think, you know, the, at, at the current devaluations are good, uh, maybe not as good as they can be, but now the, con the conviction became lower. I still, I still think that um, the pension reform will be done, probably it's more or less consensus. Uh, I think there, is a, there are high chances still for the land reform, uh, but there can be, should be certain preconditions for that. I don't think it's impossible, let's put it this way. I don't see it tomorrow, but I, I, I don't think it's impossible. Um, beyond the fifth tranche, um, we might get into delays. Um, 
Ukraine surprised on the upsides many times, so there is a scope for that uh, always. You know, like several months before the e-declarations, I could never imagine them. Uh, there is, it's a big step forward. Uh, Privat, uh, say a, a year before it happened, even months before it happened, it, it, it was very hard to imagine. So there are, you, you see difficult decisions being taken. Uh, but the history teaches us that there is also scope for the, for the, for the downside. So that, that pinch of skepticism you know, always keeps investors watching what's, uh, what's happening on the ground, uh, announcements that the tariffs won't be, uh, won't be um, increased, uh, so on. So um, it's just, I think we, you know, in, in, two, in two areas, we moved to a different uh, sort of different era. Uh, we've done, st uh, we've done Ukraine done stabilization. Um, that's that's great. Now it has to move to growth. Um, fixing monetary and fiscal policy. We saw it happening in other countries, I say including Russia. Right, we move both countries move to inflation targeting, <coughs> more prudent fiscal policy, and uh, say more Russia, less so Ukraine, stuck at structural uh, deeper reforms to generate growth. Um, but, um, but that said, I don't, uh, I'm as an economist, you know, I have two hands on the one hand and on the other hand. So, but at the same time, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't see um, reforms being stuck because of the, um, because of the pre-election period. Uh, if you think of it, right, what was the, the most painful thing Sadan? Uh, uh, Rivne adjustment done, um, hike tariffs, the, like four, time, four times hike is already done. Now there are, you know, 20% here, there, it's nothing compared to, you know, massive hike, which was done uh, two years ago. Uh, what's left to be done, um, anti-corruption reform is it unpopular not at all people are waiting for someone to be to be to go to jail <laughs> uh, this will you know you'll be a hero if you if they see some some heads rolling um, uh, privatization um, you know it won't hurt it will not hurt interests of people both these measures are now hurting uh, the interests of um, business groups um, people in power, so that's so that's so that's something that can be popular, but here you need political will. So I do not relate next push on reforms to necessarily election uh, cycle, but but we need to see the commitment from the top to to for like to deliver further steps required for the IMF to become more positive on on the outlook. Cool. So so your market weight. Yeah. A market weight. Perfect. Vladimir. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes, just to quickly to update our positioning, uh, we are also market weight. We've been, I mean, we were quite optimistic about Ukraine for quite a long period of time. Market weight now, very comfortable with the credit. It's indeed, as uh, my colleagues had mentioned, it's a high yield bond uh, with improving fundamentals, so it's really hard to ignore. Uh, just, uh, but again, um, so speaking of pitching uh, Ukraine to investors, right, in a world where, you know, countries like Tajikistan, right, place, uh, you know, borrow 7, 8% of GDP in one go at 7% uh, and for 10 years, right? Ukraine, in this kind of world, and after this huge rally, which uh, Ukrainian bonds have shown, I guess the main idea, main kind of uh, uh, effort of the pitching, uh, main kind of uh, target of the pitching effort is uh, answering the question, like, what to do next, right? And uh, uh, luckily enough, I guess Ukraine has uh, a lot to offer in that positioning, right? Because uh, with this idea of uh, improving fundamentals, uh, it could uh, uh, eventually, uh, with all these reforms and everything, could become like a normal country, right? In this case, uh, the yields should be like in most of other normal countries, and the normal means that yields is not six, seven, but more like uh, three, four, five, right? And that's a quite considerable upside. And that's uh, not something which you can find in most of, in many other markets. Actually, there are very, very few other markets who can actually uh, do the, do the um, offer such yield. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, actually, even if you look at all of those markets, uh, it's, it's really, Ukraine is almost the only one who is offering some kind of reform, consistent reform agenda, uh, which has been, some of it has been implemented and things like that. 
Um, so this actually, is, it's a, this is main, again, main selling point. So there is uh, improving fundamentals with a strong, for strong program for further improvements, which can implement. So in that case, country can change and that uh, should lead to much completely different valuations on the market. That's one thing. And of course, there is a usual concern. I mean, it was that uh, it's really hard if for anybody, I guess, uh, to look forward with and uh, without looking into the past. So the history of, uh, of these reforms, of these improvements in Ukraine, as I guess uh, Tim has uh, correctly mentioned in a previous panel, is, 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 uh, has been that after these big successes, uh, you know, the government is usually, I mean, the political will for, for reform, for changes usually fades, and it's really, really hard to kind of, um, to be optimistic on that front, yeah. Um, and uh, if you might remember, I like, guess in 2013, situation looked extremely, unfortunately, very similar, right? IMF is in town, uh, you know, the, the government is pushing this I, 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 IMF idea, um, and then, uh, you know, IMF leaves, and then the, we are, and we are, and it's like, you know, funny enough, or maybe scary enough, we are still talking about the gas tariff indexations, which IMF is uh, kind of insisting, and the government is opposing. And for some reason, it's just as if it's uh, this program, uh, this reform has already been done, and now for some reason, we are still discussing it. So this kind of ideas uh, kind of keep haunting, keep coming back, and it's, uh, it's basically very important for Ukraine basically to, may, to, to surprise on the upside again, if, if there will be a, additional upside surprise, right? So the kind of reforms will continue. So these tranches will stay. Uh, the, the tranche will be received, maybe additional tranches, as Alina is quite correct to mention. I completely agree with that. Um, most of these painful reforms have already been done, and the, the remaining reforms actually could be quite politically attractive for any incumbent politicians, let's put it this way, right? So in that sense, uh, this reform drive can easily continue, so this uh, fundamentals improving story, uh, Ukraine turning like in a quote, quote, normal economy, uh, is, is still on the table. But uh, and that I mean and that's basically that's something what needs to be seen uh, probably in the next uh, almost maybe a few weeks right uh, as, as, as the IMF tranche will be received. Okay, so just to be clear, you think the IMF money will come in let's say November is realistic or should be this year. So you, you're optimistic this year, right? Yes. Okay, Alina, you you'd be the same this year. Yeah, fourth quarter. Okay, Sergey, okay. so, so you're as optimistic well, or. I'm just wondering, in a way, Vladimir and also Lena. I mean, if you think the pro if you think the program is going to go back on track, you know, would it not be you know an overweight recommendation? I mean, it, this is, this would suggest more positive momentum coming up in the next. Yes, of indeed, months. and that could be an actually interesting combination. That uh, this reform drive continues, uh, the reforms are changing, uh, moving the needle, as we've been talking about in the last uh, panel. Uh, and on, on that, and that, and that, and one important thing is that it is it is happening in extremely, extremely comfortable uh, environment, right, on external level. If countries like Tajikistan are placing, I mean, Ukraine can do much, much better, right, and it's easy for them to do. It. And uh, unfortunately, it's also very easy to do the reverse, right, and it's also very easy to go backwards, right. You can easily frame some. I mean, for example from the minister, finance minister's speech, uh, actually was quite interesting comment about uh, the need to kind of pass through uh, results of the reform to the people, right? So basically increasingly social focus. So what does that mean exactly, right? You can easily put a lot of, you know, not so interesting things from the market perspective into this framework, right? So inclusive work, uh, social aspects uh, of uh, reforms and things like that, it could easily frame, uh, changes which are not really reforms or could be even a uh, reverse process in the reform. And, and actually a question for all three. I mean, obviously the administration has sold the three billion bond issue as an as a, as a indicator of success in terms of reform. I mean, is that fair or is the balance more towards it's just a very cheap global financing environment? It's more to do with the market than the reform agenda, would you say, or, or not? Or is it equally balanced or is it... I would say it's more of a market, unfortunately, but definitely reforms help. And uh, given the, uh, the size of the placement, I think that's large part. Of the, the size of the placement is the reforms, but the, the cost and uh, the duration is probably the market. Okay, so basically, so again, they shouldn't be complacent or overly complacent. And I mean, what message have you got post the new issue? Uh, it appeared to us that uh, after the new issue, um, 
the government is now feeling much more comfortable about its uh, you know, funding situation for the rest of the year and even probably into early next year. And they would see this as uh, a step strengthening their hand in negotiations with uh, IFIs about sequence of reforms or I don't know, specific uh, measures. I mean, IFIs don't necessarily work like this. I mean, again, if, if a tariff uh, adjustment uh, on, on an automatic basis was already passed and if, uh, you know, a disbursement was made on the basis of, of that, you know, IMF cannot come back uh, to this. They can't come back to the board and said, okay, well, we now have to review this because they then have to write, you know, kind of a special notes explaining what happened, which is, you know, uh, not, 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 not straightforward. So I would say that uh, on, on the um, uh, tariff issue, the scope for a compromise is extremely limited. I mean, clearly, uh, whatever has been agreed before uh, as sort of structural benchmarks for the next tranche will be sort of still very much in focus. I mean, and I think that could be some uh, variations of what, what exactly is the pension sort of reform package that's going to be passed. I mean, presumably, whatever has been uh, submitted to Parliament is going to be passed in unchanged form. If it, if it were to be changes, then maybe the, the, the fund will want to, to see them before kind of becoming more comfortable uh, about this particular uh, structural reform uh, development. But um, you know, the, the land reform is politically extremely tricky, and, and I think this will uh, definitely not happen until the year end and, and possibly not even next year <coughs> until the elections. And the court is, uh, I would say, the most contentious issue of, of the current kind of reform package because the government, and we've seen earlier today, clearly senior officials would want to you know, substitute the, the court with something else, either a chamber or some other agencies which would be kind of seen as, as less potentially disruptive for the current elite. And I at the moment, don't see much uh, scope for a compromise either. Uh, and IMF is not on its own in, in this. They, they clearly have kind of pulled some you know, opinions from other institutional uh, lenders and, and um, you know, agencies, and, and they still think uh, sort of that, that the court is the best, best way forward. Uh, I'm sure it will be very contentious in, until, until the last moment. Yeah. Alina, let, let's say you're wrong, and Sergei may be correct, and that we don't see the next review completed before the end of this year, and it drags into next year. Does the market care? I mean, will there be a market reaction? Or in the, in the liquid global environment, is there no penalty for countries that go off track? Yeah, I think I think yeah, I think it will be a negative surprise. I think currently, currently people do expect, or at least I think market currently sees higher likelihood of getting the tranche, uh, tranche rather than missing it, and uh, I think this is based on um, pretty high chances of pushing the pension reform, um, because even without the say more like like without the without the other legislation like this big step would allow it, this is a significant step forward so it would be it's hard to for the IMF to ignore it um, the next tranche can be less than than two billion uh, right it, it happened in the past uh, so to acknowledge some step forward and to still to keep the inf incentives there but yeah I think it would be it would be a negative surprise um, Okay, so the three analysts are off the hook now. I've got my recommendation, so that's perfect. Andre, uh, you're in Washington at the IF, you know, a very respected institution. You produce great macro forecasts. So, you know, what's the view from Washington? And perhaps it'd be useful just to give, you know, the audience, you know, what, what's your thinking in terms of the macro outlook? Uh, a bit more detail in I'm terms sure. of the when, figures, when perhaps? You, when you say Washington, I don't know what exactly what part of Washington you <laughs> mean. Uh, we are on... Uh, east side of the White House, so uh, you look at things a little differently maybe than, than the IMF. We are a private in institution, uh, but if you look at the medium term outlook and we try to find out, run consistency checks. We, we look at the country and we try to put things together and see whether what, what we hear and what, what the plans are, whether they are consistent with the medium term outlook. And in these terms, I think 
before I, I jump into it, I would say that the IMF program, usually in, when you look at the countries, how successful they were during the IMF program, usually those countries that took the IMF program as a minimum and did more than IMF asked for were successful. Those that just filled what, what the IMF asked them to do, they are usually not that successful. So what, what, I, what I hear here and what, what makes me a little nervous is that the IMF here is seen as a, as a maximum of possible things. No, it should be the minimum. Um, so look what, what Latvia did in the IMF program. They overreached and they stabilized and uh, they went through, through deep, deep crisis to a growth relatively quickly. So IMF should be seen here as a, as a minimum, not as a, as a maximum. That, that before I, I go into our own analysis. And when I look at the, at the numbers, uh, th th there's, one, uh, there's one problem that uh, I have with the, with the framework of, of reforms looking from the macroeconomic point of, of view. Uh, the, the, the program is structured in a way that, uh, started in a way, the, the, the Ukraine runs the current account deficit. And uh, it went into almost a balance, but quickly went back to a deficit about 4% of GDP, which is about $4 billion on an annual basis. It needs to be financed somehow. So far, it's financed by the debt. But that's not probably something that you would want to do on, on a longer term. It's not sustainable for, for uh, a few more years. Uh, so you need to replace this with either uh, eliminate the current account deficit, or replace the financing with, with, the, with the equity FDI. Is this happening? So far not. And I'm, I'm worried that uh, the time window for, for stabilization might be running out. Look at the uh, macroeconomic framework. The inflation now is in low double digits. Maybe it will go to high single digits next year. And at the same time, we have a exchange rate which is more or stable. Well, not, not in the last few weeks, but still it's relatively stable. And we have wages that are growing by 30% plus. So when I look at the at Ukraine from outside, what I see is the relatively fast real appreciation of, 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 of currency. I see the unit uh, labor costs are increasing tremendously. And I don't see underlying growth in productivity. So that's if, if all these things are true, then the logical conclusion is that the productivity and competitiveness of the uh, economy is decreasing, which of course is exact opposite of what needs to, needs to happen. So, and this might last for this year financing is, is taken care of by, by IMF and by the strength of the bond. Next year might be okay as well if the IMF range comes in. And so there's no, no worry about 2017, 18, but this is not the model that would be sustainable for a longer term period of time. So what needs to be changed is probably the growth of productivity and way of financing uh, the current account deficit. And the only way that, from experience of the transition economies in, in Central Europe, the only sustainable way and, uh, and uh, uh, sustainable, <coughs> sustainable way of, of doing this is attracting foreign investors, equity and FDI in NDL case. And unless this happens, uh, the, the macroeconomic stability will be very, very vulnerable, fragile, and um, I don't think it can last for longer than one, one additional year, and uh, when the cracks will, will, will be visible, and situation might change. And just imagine what happens when the hurricane starts depreciating again, that will have consequences for, for debt, which is uh, foreign exchange denominated uh, to a large extent, and what, what will happen with inflation. So these things, the macroeconomic stability is not something which is given. This is something that has to be maintained on, on, on a continuous basis. And uh, as I said, Ukraine has, a, has done a tremendous job in the last three years. That's to be appreciated. But now <laughs> it needs to be going further. You know, it, it's not, not you, can, you, you never can stop. You have to go further and change the structure. And it has not happened yet. We are not yet in a mo mode that will be sustainable without further changes. So that's, that, that's, that's our worry. And as we, as we travel to Ukraine very often, and we always talk to authorities, and we always hear the same stories. We are going to do privatization, land reform, pension reform. That's, that's great, but actually we need these things to be, to, 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 to be put, put on the ground and change the facts on the ground. Uh, have plans is a great, and uh, most of these things that we hear are, are great, and we all agree that this is needed to be done and has to be needed done. But it's time to, to really do it and change it on, on the fact, on, on the ground. And uh, that, that, that's, 
that's my opening, and then we will discuss further. Yeah. Perfect. Actually, Vladislav, uh, so uh, a Ukrainian origin person outside the country working for BIS, I mean, looking back in and coming back over, I mean, how do you view Ukraine and, you know, its challenges and, and, the, and I guess, you know, you've, you've, been, you've sat through a whole day of, of, uh, of the conference like myself. I mean, you know, what are, what, what's missing, perhaps? Um, well, first I want to say about maybe what's, what's there. Um, for me, the change has been overall positive, but I've been absent maybe for too long. So I don't see this uh, more like intra-monthly, intra-yearly dynamics of how the reform process is going. And um, as Tim mentioned, uh, I work for BIS, and it's, uh, it's an organization of central banks, where central banks are our shareholders, and we manage central bank reserves and provide some investment vehicles for them. Uh, facilitate foreign exchange interventions. We also host the standard setting committees like the Basel Committee. And I work for a Committee on the Global Financial System, but it, will, it used to be called the Euro Dollar Standing Committee. So one of our jobs is to inform the governors uh, about Euro Dollar offshore lending by banks, uh, what's going on in international bond markets. And in that context, I just wanted to uh, kind of delve a bit more into the positive aspect of this recent bond issuance uh, that uh, uh, Ukrainian government just uh, uh, undertook. So uh, the yield was about 400 basis points, which is uh, the spread relative to treasury was about 400 basis points, which is like pretty high. But we should also remember that it's very long maturity and being able to issue a long maturity bond in and of itself, especially less than two years after massive debt restructuring, should be seen as a big achievement. Um, and uh, why is this important? Well, previously, if you look at the BIS statistics, hardly any of uh, Ukraine's outstanding debt was above three-year maturity. So there was not even a prospect of forming something like a benchmark yield curve in the dollar for foreign institutional investors. Um, also, long maturity means that Ukrainian government has reduced rollover uh, risk for its financing. This is very important because as um, Andre has mentioned, financing the current account deficit is extremely important at this point and constitutes a key financial stability risk in the medium term and Ukraine needs stable long-term foreign currency inflow beyond what uh, official lenders can provide. And finally, um, there's been uh, quite a bit said uh, by Sergei uh, and also others about the current extremely accommodative environment globally. And again, here, the maturity of the debt matters a lot. Why? Because the monetary policies of central banks like Federal Reserve, Bank of Japan, ECB, that ex expanded their balance sheets massively, that keep yields compressed, worked extensively on the long end of the curve. That's where the benefits are highest for borrowers. And Ukraine has now actually managed to reap some of those benefits in the form of this issue. Uh, in doing so, uh, as you know, part of the deal was also buying back some of the uh, short shortly maturing debt. This time, uh, what did the government do? They bought it at a premium, at a, uh, higher than the par. However, issuing long-term debt is, could be quite advantageous for Ukraine's foreign currency inflows and financing because as central banks unwind their balance sheets and global yields rise, some of this debt could be bought back at a discount. Instead of buying back own debt at a premium, we could buy our debt at a discount and refinance that way. And I think a smart uh, treasurer would take uh, the medium term outlook for global yields into account. And this bond issue fits into this picture. And finally, of course, uh, this opens an opportunity for Ukrainian corporates to also tap longer term debt markets and start returning to global debt markets, given that the sovereign is now uh, active at the long end of the curve. Um, what, what were the positive developments that uh, 
predicated uh, this uh, debt issuance, made it possible. Well, if you read uh, Moody's uh, commentary to why they upgraded the rating for Ukraine, it was uh, fiscal reforms and external position. So if one thinks about, well, where, what should we emphasize going forward and where should priorities be, it should be on the type of reforms that go into the same direction to make this market access sustained. So of course, pension reform will further improve Ukraine's fiscal position. I mean, right now, Ukraine's pension deficit is like second highest relative to GDP in Europe. This is unsustainable. And external position. So there, this is much more difficult. Agricultural reform, for example, would be needed because that's a key export sector for Ukraine, potentially. Um, now, I also agree with uh, most of the panelists that even though these reforms so far have enabled Ukraine to tap the global uh, financing once again, uh, the backdrop has been uh, global liquidity and this ease of financing. If you think, what, what is the other country that has bond spreads of 400 basis points? It's Argentina. What did they do earlier this year? They issued a century bond. So. It's, it says much less about Ukraine or Argentina. It says much more about the current accommodative liquidity conditions. Um, so in that sense, it's even more important, I think, to use this global liquidity to Ukraine's advantage and try to maintain and access to the long-term financing now, get for foreign currency inflows to finance current account deficits that are expected to persist over the several years, which and hopefully also lead uh, the private sector in uh, being able to raise foreign currency funding as well. Um, let me just stop here and then maybe you can continue. Perfect. Chris, you've waited a long time. Um, I've kept you hanging. Um, I mean, slightly different perspective. Uh, historian, academic, and, and kind of journalist. I mean, from a regional perspective, I mean, how, how, are, you, how are you viewing Ukraine and reforms? And you, you get around quite a bit, so. Well, let me try to draw two lessons from the history of Ukraine's neighbors to understand where Ukraine is today. Uh, the first will be about where reforms are going and, and whether they're going. And the second would be why reforms alone aren't enough to get sustained GDP growth at the level that uh, Ukraine's government thinks it can achieve. Uh, on the first point about reforms, if you look at the coalition that's backed reforms in Ukraine over the past three years since Maidan, there's been a couple of different factors at play. One is we've had a lot of foreign pressure from the IMF, from the European Union, from Ukraine's international partners, which has been very productive in pushing the government in a positive direction. Second, you had reform, you had uh, pressure from the population to actually make change happen on the ground, especially after Maidan. There was a lot of energy coming from civil society, uh, from the electorate. I mean, third, you've had a great group of technocrats in the government that have been very effective um, at identifying what needs to be done and more or less pushing through the agenda uh, that they set out to do. And where Ukraine is right now, uh, from what I can tell, is that that coalition is breaking apart. You have international pressure is diminishing for a number of reasons. One is because international partners are less focused on Ukraine. The IMF, as we've already mentioned, is potentially losing leverage because Ukraine can already tap international markets. And so there's less reason to think that international partners will be as active in pressuring Ukraine next year as they were last year. So that, that note of pressure is going to decrease in importance. Uh, similarly, you're seeing uh, a change in the technocrats who are involved in government. This has already happened to a certain extent, but I think it's an open question whether we're likely to see uh, the same people who have been pushing reforms through thus far uh, sticking around in the three to five year period. That's a question mark. And so Ukraine's gonna have to rely a lot more on the third factor, which is popular pressure to keep reforms going. And if you look at the history of reforms over the past 25 years in Central and Eastern Europe, what you notice is that during periods of crisis, it's possible to rely on technocrats and on foreign pressure to push through reform. But if you're looking at a five or a 10 or a 15 year time horizon, you need mechanisms that connect popular discontent with actual changes in the government. And that's where historically Ukraine has failed to uh, translate popular unhappiness to actual change. So the question is, I think right now, are those mechanisms being developed? Is the new civil society activity we've seen over the past couple of years enough to, to on its own push, uh, push change forward? And that's where I think the jury is still out, where it remains to be seen uh, whether we can uh, have elections that lead to better politicians coming to office, elections that lead to uh, changes actually being implemented uh, the way the populace wants to see changes implemented. 
And that also impacts the reform agenda too because uh, it puts a higher uh, priority on making reforms that are understandable and popular with the populace at large. So during a time of crisis, it's easy to tell the population, we need to do tough reforms because it's a crisis. But as the time from the crisis subsides, it becomes harder to sell reform as something painful, and it becomes more important to find ways where reform is seen as a good thing rather than something that's painful but necessary. So that's a really hard change to make, and certain countries have succeeded. Ukraine in the past has struggled, and so I think right now we need to figure out which path is Ukraine on, and can we get those popular mechanisms to actually affect governance uh, on the ground. So that's my first point, is why, you, why reform is going to be tougher next year than it was last year. Um, the second point, drawing again from the experience of Ukraine's neighbors, is that reform alone is not enough. It's absolutely crucial, but it's not enough if you want to see the levels of growth that Ukraine's government thinks Ukraine is capable of achieving. In the last panel, we had the finance minister saying he could envision Ukraine at 5, 6, 7 percent a year GDP growth. Uh, I think that's an optimistic assessment, but if you wanted to get higher GDP growth than you are today, uh, one of the things where Ukraine has really um, stood out in a bad way compared to its neighbors is the scale of FDI, especially in the 1990s and early 2000s, but even since then, all of Ukraine's neighbors to the West have been getting a lot more FDI than Ukraine. And why is that? One is obviously the reform agenda. Um, it's been more successful than many of Ukraine's neighbors, but that's not the only thing. Uh, there are two other factors that I'd highlight. One is infrastructure. If you want to attract uh, companies to invest in Ukraine and have Ukraine be part of their supply chains, you need better infrastructure so they can be confident that just-in-time manufacturing, that, um, that their infrastructure is going to be uh, effective to fit in their supply chains. And the second thing, which we've talked less about than I think I, I expected, is, is politics. Will Ukraine stay politically stable? What will the 2019 elections look like? It's easy to envision scenarios where that causes disruptions, not only politically, but also uh, economically. And I think that's a, a bigger question mark uh, than it's been given due thus far today. I don't know what the answer to that question is, but there's no doubt that um, if 2019 goes in a direction that markets don't expect, that's going to have an effect not only um, in the short run, but also in the long run. Because Ukraine's number one challenge is to, is, to, is to get European investors to see it like more of a normal country, to get to the point where it's seen in the same category as Slovenia or Slovakia. And right now it's not there, and political stability is absolutely crucial to getting it there. So those are kind of the two historical lessons that I would draw out from the history of Ukraine's neighbors and why they've been able to see higher GDP growth over the past two decades than Ukraine has. Cool. Actually, a question for the broader panel. I mean, I mean, I guess my concern now when I think of Ukraine and, and where we are is, is, you know, we're approaching elections. Um, it's just a danger of kind of populism and, and, and a pro-growth agenda from uh, Poroshenko in the run-up to those elections. Because you look at the fiscal side, I mean, they've got, uh, I think, three billion in the bank, probably more now. They've done the Eurobond, right? So the fiscal position looks pretty strong. Um, I don't necessarily disagree. Well, I don't necessarily agree with you, I should say. I mean, I think in this very forgiving global market, you know, they've got a two billion borrowing program for next year. I mean, could they come early? Could they come to market early, get more cash in the bank? And next year, it's all about loosening the fiscal purse springs to basically get some, generate some growth. I mean, why would Poroshenko not do that? It just seems you know, an obvious thing. Why would he do things that are still, I mean, I, I forget who mentioned the fact that, you know, um, the, oh, actually it was Alina that you mentioned that, um, you know, the anti-corruption agenda is not unpopular in the country. Well, it's very unpopular in the RADA, right? Because, you know, they all go to jail or, or a significant portion, I should say. Uh, not a majority. Uh, a, a lot of people potentially, allegedly could go to jail, right? So, I mean, it's difficult to get through, right? So, so why not a burst of populism? Well, I think we would be idealists if we wouldn't expect populism. I think we should expect populism and uh, it's just a matter of scale. I think whatever country you look at ahead of elections, there is some increase in spending. Even if you have a fiscal rule in place, talking about Russia, right, there are wages increases coming. So, um, yeah, I mean, there will, but um, at the same time, this year you have a, a um, fiscal deficit that is going to be less than e um, expected in the IMF program. So you have some fiscal room to increase spending. Um, the tax administration has been gradually improving. Um, so uh, it just just depends how far you how far you go. Um, yeah, I think I think there will there will be um, there will be increase in populism. Um, the 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 ratings are unclear. So uh, at least forty percent of population 
doesn't know who they will vote for. So yeah, we're going uh, into a fierce fight for votes, uh, and we have lots of candidates with almost equal chances. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that that will be a test here on on you know whether you want to position yourself as a reformer. And to me, the prime minister, uh, at least his ambitions looked like that. Or or you you wanna yeah or you you wanna appeal uh, to to people who are looking for um, you know uh, Soviet type of relationship between the government and the population, where you know you feed us and we stay quiet and give you our votes. Um, so yeah, but uh, you know, I want to say that if you look at Kiev, civil society, from what I see, there is a demand for reforms. If you're going populist, you know, going off track, the IMF, I don't think this necessarily add uh, will will be good for you in terms of at, le at least at least how, how how people look at you in say in, bi in big cities, not 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 uh, say in. Um, um, yeah, in the rest of Ukraine, yeah. Perfect. Actually, Andre, this may be a little bit unfair here, but um, you do sit in Washington. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 know, you don't represent the Trump administration in any, any shape, way, shape, or form, but we talk about external anchors. I mean, I mean when, when you obviously get around the kind of think tank, sort of academic government kind of circles in DC, right? And like, is there fatigue? Is there Ukraine fatigue? Is there, an, is there a willingness to basically adopt a pretty hard, aggressive, uh, you know, stance towards Ukraine and backtracking on reform? I mean, you know, I guess if you go back to previous U.S. ambassadors here, we've had some very vocal ambassadors who really pushed forward the reform agenda. So, I mean, is D.C. willing to put its head, head above the parapet? I mean, is there any, any leadership actually from D.C. on Ukraine? That's a fair kind of question, I guess. Well, at the end, you, you got there. It's, it's deeply unfair. Uh, question. Uh, we have a couple of people devoted almost completely to try to understand what the administration is after. Okay? Uh, these people are highly qualified and they know the capital, they know the hill, they know, as they call it. And they come, come back once a week and, and we have a meeting when we talk about what we have done last week and what we think is, is happening. And um, they always come and say, we have no clue actually. Uh, the administration has an attention span of goldfish. That, that's, that's how they describe it. So if something bad happens, maybe, yeah, they will be attractive. If there's a good TV opportunity, then yeah, they will be attractive. If there's nothing uh, that could be used in, um, in do for domestic purposes, then Ukraine is not on our, on, our, on our agenda. Which is, of course, unfortunate because we, we we, we haven't mentioned that, but uh, the Ukraine has, is, is a situation which is not comparable to Slovakia and Slovenia because it's a country in a war and it's a country with a neighbor that wants it to, to remain in a bad shape. So that's something completely different from Slovakia and Slovenia because so we, have a, we, we are lucky enough that we have a neighbor that wanted us to succeed. Ukraine has a neighbor that wanted to fail. So this is a completely different situation. And I think that the lack of attention from Washington is, is, is not helping in this sense. Cool. Um, again, I, I'm asking really unfair questions here, so I'm on a roll, so I may as well carry on. So I'm tempted to ask the question, you know, obviously, you know, Sergei, I think Alina, you were in Moscow recently, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and Sergei, you've probably been, I think you also mentioned you've been in Moscow recently as well. I mean, you know, okay, and, 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 and Mints, but not Moscow, but obviously there are some exercises ongoing or have been there, but anyway, maybe you got some feedback from there. So, I mean, you know, the Russia view of Ukraine, and I mean, what's, is there any nuances or any, I mean, how, we, how is Putin viewing Ukraine now? I mean, I mean, it's a hard one to ask, I know, but I mean, you know, Putin's kind of stepped back a bit, you know, he, he's sort of try, I guess like everyone trying to figure out politics in the White House and also politics in Ukraine itself. I mean, do you anticipate Russia will stay on the sidelines for an extended period of time? I mean, that's a fair question, I guess. Well, let me start. Um, I think Russia uh, under Putin managed to achieve most of its uh, near-term objectives in Ukraine uh, with uh, relatively uh, small costs compared to what would require the West to prop Ukraine up. But these costs have not been entirely insignificant. I mean, 
the eastern regions are in a very tight uh, financial situation and ultimately it is the Russian government either via you know, defense ministry budget or some other allocations that have to make sure people do not starve and, and there are some subsidies or some other transfers going through because of course the uh, government of the ramp of Ukraine, the main part of Ukraine don't uh, really take any responsibility at the moment for paying pensions or any other uh, social allocations to the people in the eastern regions. Uh, there's been some intense speculation in recent weeks in uh, local media, uh, mainly in Russia, but I think some Ukrainian outlets have picked up on this story. Uh, Mr. Surkov apparently uh, visited uh, the eastern regions, met with uh, the, the leaders there, and the message coming from these meetings is that, well, First of all, you have to focus on sort of new generation of people, which means that Russia would be open to some personnel changes, which is a step forward, I would say. But more importantly, uh, apparently, the message was that um, these regions should be prepared, not necessarily kind of gearing for, but prepared for an eventual reintegration with the rest of Ukraine, which would be a breakthrough. And because that comes uh, at the same time as Russia's sort of unexpected uh, flexibility on the peacekeepers uh, role, uh, I mean, the, the perception is that uh, clearly at the current stage of Russia's you know, political evolution, you know, even an election cycle, they have very important elections in, in, in uh, March of next year, uh, Russia wants to focus on uh, key things and sort of probably not waste as much resources as have has been the case before because you know Russia's growth is still not there where, where sort of policymakers would want it to see uh, the real incomes are not growing strongly in inflation adjusted even inflation sort of coming down rapidly it's still very shallow growth and uh, disposable income hasn't really expanded that much so there are projects locally in Russia that the government would rather you know, allocate its resources towards rather than sort of funding a, a project, if you can call it a project, in eastern parts of Ukraine, which is still you know, a neighboring country. Uh, or there's something else going on which it is very hard to see because you know, criminology is back as a very you know, serious sort of field of, of science. People look at the headlines and faces and, and moves and, and they have very little understanding what's going on because the system has come back to you know, Soviet days and it's the ultimate guessing game. But the most recent signs have been fairly encouraging. And Alina, what, what were Russians asking you about Ukraine when you were, you were over there? Uh, uh, this time it was rather me and us uh, asking the speakers, but... Uh, Did Ukraine come up at all in, in discussion? It did a lot, yes, it did uh, a lot. Um, uh, I think that, yeah, there is, there is a view that US-Russia relations at their lowest level, um, maybe not ever, but, 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 but pretty low. Um, just recently, just recently, you know, the sanctions, uh, new sanctions of US um, on Russia, basically uh, reducing the significantly reducing the chances of sanctions being lifted in the future, removing this power from President Trump, mean that mean that uh, you know there are much more chances for these relations to deteriorate, and so so yeah, Russia now takes efforts uh, to at least stabilize them and not not like not not to let them you know go. Um, uh, go even lower. Um, I, the very fact of, you know, the very fact of freezing sanctions uh, me meant that developments in Ukraine could go either way, uh, because sanctions were initially structured so that, you know, you you keep Russia on the le on the short leash and you can, you know, increase them or decrease them depending on how how situation evolves. Frozen. You know, the, the the contra argument was keep them keep them f keep sanctions flexible because then then they will have no in incentives uh, to 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 um, 
to improve uh, the situation in Donbas. Now it seems Russia's strategy is, you know, if you, it's it's harder now to make friends with US. You try to make friends with Europe, and this unity on sanctions approach has been already broken because you know uh, US stepped forward uh, and ramped up them, but it was without coordination with EU. It was for the first time since since, since uh, Ukraine crisis. So yeah, this this is attempt to stabilize your relations with the US, uh, keep things as, as, as stable in terms of foreign politics and domestic politics before elections, uh, and trying to build stronger relations with Europe um, as opposed to as opposed to yes uh, this this issue came up a lot and uh, but but in terms of Ukraine, people see this uh, that um, the position of Putin has changed uh, when he allowed or admitted the possibility of uh, the peacekeepers, UN, um, um, United Nations personnel on the ground, providing them um, arms for, for, for their defense purposes. And uh, historically, since Soviet times, allowing UN contingent on, on the ground means you gave up some control. So, yeah, that was, um, uh, you know, the, the, the devil is in the details, right? It, it will matter a lot whether they are, where they are positioned, whether between U Ukraine, whether between Donbass, Ukraine territory, or, uh, and, and Russia, or between, or, or on the borderline where the, 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 the line of fire, but, uh, but uh, still, this, uh, this can be a positive development. Cool. Uh, Chris, as the only U.S. citizen on the panel, you're totally responsible for the Trump administration and its view. So, uh, and what's the U.S. your perspective in terms of Russia, uh, Russia, U.S., Ukraine? I mean, how that fits together or doesn't? Well, it's interesting on the U.S. side. There's clearly one very important person in the United States who doesn't care about Ukraine, and that's the president. Um, but if you look at everyone below him, there's actually been very little change in U.S. policy. Um, and so, the good news from Ukraine's perspective is that. Uh, the president doesn't care about Ukraine, so he's not interested in Ukraine policy, and he's very disorganized and incompetent in general, which, is, which means that all of his people below him are actually running policy. So if you talk to people at the State Department, at the Pentagon, there's been no change whatsoever in U.S. policy towards Ukraine. Now, is that an optimal solution for Ukraine? No. Uh, is it better than people were expecting in January? I think yes. Um, on the question of, of Russia and Ukraine, I also spend a fair amount of time in Moscow. And from my perspective, the, the kind of dominant Russian view is that Ukraine is a failed state. Uh, the Poroshenko government is not stable. Ukraine has had two revolutions, or coups as the Russians would call them, uh, since 1991. And so their view is that there's no reason to expect that the 2019 elections will go off without a hitch. Indeed, they're planning to uh, help that process along by creating difficulties around the election. And their hope is that um, after 2019, they'll be able to find a party that they can deal with and cut a better deal then after Poroshenko is out of the scene when they have a more pro-Russian government. So I don't know if it's going to work, but I think that is their strategy to wait and see. So I wouldn't put much faith at all in uh, the, the peacekeeper initiative. And I don't really actually see it as a concession in any way, because uh, as was mentioned, they haven't said where they're willing to put the peacekeepers. And that's a very important uh, difference. So from my perspective, I think the Kremlin's waiting until 2019. There's not going to be a change um, from either the EU or the US side. And so that issue is basically on hold um, until Russia changes its mind about whether Ukraine's actually going to uh, be willing to do a, a type of deal that it wants over the Donbass or not. That seems to me unlikely. So the Saakashvili Poroshenko um, battle was stage managed for Moscow to, to imply that the political elite in Ukraine are in, in, in total disarray to keep Russia on the sidelines until 2019. Maybe not, but anyway, that, yeah. something like that. Anyway, uh, Can I jump in on one more thing, Tim. Yeah, sure. On, on the populism question, which you raised, you know, I think it's wrong to ask: Is there a risk from populism? I think the question is: What type of populism does Ukraine need, and will it get? Because it does seem to me that there's a, a long history of very effective populism, which is to say, mobilizing the population to support better government in Ukraine. You only have to look back to the Maidan to see the legacy of that. The problem is that there's a risk of bad populism as well as good populism. And so I think what I'll be looking for in advance of the next electoral cycle is what type of populism are we seeing? Is it, is it more handouts to, uh, to pensioners that are already doing relatively well, certain groups of pensioners, or is it going to be focused on anti-corruption or privatization or other efforts that are popular and are important? So that's the way I would phrase the question.
Philip Wong, the Jewish Folk Song Channel, uh, the Jewish Folk Song Channel, believed that the population has the ability to participate politically without mobilizing itself in the form of uh, mass protest. Essentially, is there a democratic process that can exist without another revolution? Because it's clear that uh, I think the population would like is more anti-corruption uh, measures. Uh, how can they achieve that? The goal that I would say, and this is looking at Eastern Europe's experience, is to move from a situation where everything depends on civil society, so protest movements, civil society groups, to where elections have consequences for reforms. So where you can vote for a political party and know what they stand for in terms of economic policy, that's actually hard to do in Ukraine today. But when you get to that point where you have a clear party on the left and a party on the right and you know what they stand for, that will actually enable citizens to vote for specific policies. And that's somewhere where Ukraine hasn't historically been on economic policy questions. But once you get there, then the population can say, we want X, we want Y, and we know who to vote for in order to get that. So I don't think we're there yet, but we that's... Uh, I'd like to hope so. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, actually, the other... You, so okay. I mean, just to follow up, uh, I think it's been painfully little in terms of uh, political uh, or electorate reform in recent years precisely because uh, most of the representatives of the elite are perfectly fine with the current system. I mean, uh, the election system ensures that half of the MPs are elected locally, so they can be easily sort of, uh, you know, influenced to, to support uh, you know, government, if need be, but they also have a local agenda, and that means that uh, most of political groups would have a, a political base in, in a particular region and uh, you know, ensures their survival, whatever swings in public mode uh, happen. Uh, and as a result of the whole system, you know, the incentives for the elite to see the return of the eastern regions back into the political kind of space of Ukraine, these incentives are very low, if not non-existent. I mean, with the exception of, of course, the, the opposition bloc, which would gain a lot of <laughs> supporters, but otherwise, you know, we have exactly the same uh, very rigid uh, and, and reform kind of resistant structure of, of local politics. I mean, the local political space is long divided. I mean, we don't see many political leaders. We don't see any, you know, bright political actors and players in, in the field. And it's been very frustrating, I would say, for an outside observer to see this. So I'm wondering why, you know, the, the Western supporters of Ukrainian democracy are focusing just on financial uh, area or like the big thing like oh, Russia-Ukraine standoff and not much has been done in sort of trying to incentivize the, the elite to kind of move on and have uh, a more you know, reform-prone political system. Alina, do you fancy a career in politics? <laughs> Um, I mean, on civil society first, I think uh, it is emerging, and I think the dynamics is obviously positive. Um, I think there is, yeah, while it's still hard, you know, there is no, there are no lifts, um, uh, like politically, which which can bring new, uh, new elite, new political elite to the parliament. Uh, but it is obvious that the uh, the public opinion now matters much more. Uh, even a simple post on Facebook can stop corruption, uh, or like attempts to 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 for to get a bribe. There are good examples. Um, uh, stop or delay? <laughs> no, stop. Yeah, or yeah, attract attention of of of. Uh, authorities, um, you know, police, uh, get it investigated, um, you know, fire someone, yes. Uh, um, but no, I agree, I agree the, the, that, that, that comes together with anti-corruption reforms, right? You, you have reforms required by the IMF and uh, outside which, are, which, which um, step on the toes of the population, but the other part, the other major part is uh, on changing the rules of the game changing the very nature of the system uh, you know if and and that's 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 the something which countries have been struggling with and um, 
you know, I'm now mixing, you know, anti-corruption and political reform, but these are all key stakeholders which resist both. And um, um, yeah, both in Georgia and Romania, you saw that, you know, this is very painful. Many people have to go to jail to change the nature uh, so that people, even if they stay, they will change their behavior because y their ups and downs now shift and they know that there is puni certain punishments for certain actions. Um, yeah, um, I don't know, I probably m m mixed it coming back to anti-corruption <laughs> story, but um, politics, uh, I think, not follows, but goes hand in hand with, 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 with those issues. Did you want to comment or, or not? Yeah, may just to follow up on the, on the previous com com comments and uh, maybe come back to, to the market <laughs> valuations and all. So basically, I, had, I was um, kind of uh, from the, in the previous panels, a lot of people were saying that there is no other way, right, for Ukraine. There's only forms, only this ambitious agenda, you know, mark and all that stuff, IMF and things like that. I kind of tend to disagree because there is always another way. And uh, and if you look at the numbers from just pure kind of a government perspective, I think if you you can actually make a conclusion that everything is just fine, right? I mean, there is growth, and and uh, given the if you like dig into macro and like what the growth drivers are, it, it does look like that the level of uh, this recovery which is going on, the people are saying that it's very fragile. I don't really think that it is that fragile. Because the economy has fallen that much, and uh, the, there was so much of an adjustment and the value added redistribution to corporates, you know. So, and the economy is so cheap these days, so it probably can grow. Even if you don't do anything, it will probably grow by like 2 3% a year without doing anything, just on base effect and just on the dynamics of what things that have already been done, right? And the uh, dynamics on this impulse from the de agreement devaluation and things like that. So from that perspective, the economy is growing, unemployment falling, real wage growth in double digits, as we've been mentioning, you know, what's, what's wrong? I mean, everything is fine. And in this kind of conditions, um, this uh, populism, I think, can have uh, easily be, I mean, you can easily forget about IMF even. Um, uh, and uh, I don't think it will be actually be uh, catastrophic in a sense because uh, with this with these markets, you can easily roll over, keep rolling over the market, uh, roll over the debt. Uh, and uh, the you know this the sustainability problem is no longer there as, as this three billion placement has shown right we effectively addressed the problem of 2017-18 and in that sense Ukraine can easily kick can down the road as this was saying and uh, this road can be quite long maybe no it's not indefinite right uh, at some point we we need to get back to reforms as it uh, but. Uh, there are a few years, and it's not maybe maybe more than a few years, right? So you can you can go back in some reforms on the populist way, and uh, you know with these drastic changes which this country has done, there is plenty of room to do this on coming back to some extent, right? And uh, this is probably the other way, and that's why I think, as as I said, it's not going to be catastrophic for markets with these markets. So that's why I think you stay under uh, market weight these days with an upside, uh, let's say, option uh, of uh, reforms and uh, Ukraine becoming moving to the normal country category with uh, low single digit yields. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I just want to introduce a bit of a disagreement into this mix. Um, so I think I disagree a little bit with Vladimir. Um, and I think there's a bit of an urgency, actually, not to be complacent about the current developments. Uh, there was an IMF study looking into what happens in, with emerging market economies after they restructure their debt. And they just looked at a period from 98 to 2011 or so. And Ukraine right now is exactly the average of, of what is expected. You know, 3 4% growth, inflation 12%, a bit higher than expected. Uh, fiscal, fiscal deficit again around 3 4%. Accessing markets again after one or two years, this is the average. So I don't think we're doing like so much better than the average. Uh, Where there's some concern is what happens if uh, these investors who are just now finally starting to look at Ukraine from a positive side and are seeing some narrative that is positive, if they get jittery or if monetary policies tighten abruptly. And there, again, Ukraine's by the parameters of the deficit, external debt, uh, current account deficit or fiscal deficit, both three, four percent. External debt, over a hundred percent of GDP. We are right in the middle of these economies that used to be called like fragile five, 
if you remember the 2013 taper tantrum, where there were some jitters that the Fed would raise rates and there were massive outflows from emerging markets, India, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, and, and one more. So on, on these parameters, I think we should seize this opportunity but not be, not be complacent at, at all. This is, we're just doing just average given the support that Ukraine is receiving and competent governance, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't celebrate at this point. And for Ukraine to actually catch up with the rest of European Union uh, in terms of growth to deal with the non-performing loan issue, the growth rate has to be much higher than 3%. For a country such as Ukraine, it has to be double that, double that rate. So I would agree with Alina there that, for example, now real growth should be a top priority. Um, Vlad is hovering at the back with a question. So I have to give him one. Maybe a comment, because I actually agree with Vladimir, what, what, what Vladimir said. Eh? There is a Ukrainian path, a specific, unique path, Ukraine, which is named Grably. This is a Ukrainian strategy. Grably is a rake, yeah, I think, in, in English. Eh? So this is the way where we go already every year, every, every time after the next uh, IMF program. So we achieve some macro stabilization, we achieve some financial stabilization, and later we think that we don't need IMF already furthermore. And uh, the 2-3% two, two, growth is, could be nice for the government, but unfortunately not so nice for people, because uh, there is not coming convergence with uh, other European countries. I'm not, we're not saying about well, China, you know, because the Europe, uh, in some European countries, our peers grow 4%, 4.5%. Uh, and uh, therefore, if we go to 3% and later being open economy, small open economy, after six, seven years, we have the, the new crisis. Uh, so the people usually have uh, much, much lower uh, disposal income, uh, revenues, uh, et cetera, et cetera, after the, after the next crisis. So Ukrainian path, unique path is named Grably. We can go and I think we will be successful in this strategy. If we want to go a little bit further from this path, uh, we need to look at uh, what IMF is recommending. Thanks. I don't yeah, think that was a question. Yeah. But anyway, I just think... To comment on this, uh, just to make sure this is not my baseline, I do think that there will be reforms. I kind of I listen to Minister Daniel Luke. I find it really reassuring that he's you kind know, of reassuring us that this is okay. But I'm just saying that this is an option. I mean, this is not just, you know, it's not the one-way street. Uh, it's not that the all reforms will happen tomorrow. Uh, there are other scenarios, unfortunately, and it's just uh, one of the risks which a lot of people are raising on the market. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Alina. Yeah, thanks. Um, I agree that uh, similar to every person who can choose their way or change their way, like the roads that we choose, is that the name of the book? I don't know. I know it's in Russian or in Ukrainian, um, the title. So, yeah, Ukraine can change the path. And there is always, I, I even probably three years ago, we tend to appear on the same panel. And back then I called it um, the road of Georgia and the road of Belarus, right? Whatever you choose. So, uh, you know, Belarus is stable. Uh, um, and probably that, that, that's basically it. Or you can choose, uh, you know, to go through painful reforms, uh, much more volatility and potentially some military conflict, but, uh, you know, keep following your dream, a Ukrainian <laughs> dream, and, uh, and, yeah, and see where you, you end up. But uh, I, I, I also agree with uh, Vlad, you know, because uh, looking at Ukraine political life, it, it tends to change the, the direction very often. And probably it's a problem of politics and polit politicians, but also the electorate, which, which uh, you know, um, very easily attracted or disappointed and, uh, yeah, and, and uh, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't follow the, the, the direction consistently. Now probably, you know, coming back to Russia politically becomes less likely, but, uh, you know, over the last uh, 20 years, Ukraine has changed the direction so much that um, we can see we can see it going <laughs> pretty much <laughs> in any in any direction. I was a terrible host and left no time for questions, but I don't. If the panel is okay with carrying on a little bit, um, we could certainly take some more questions. So, are there any any other questions that are kind of burning in the audience? Hi, my name is uh, Magnus Sherman. 
I had a question for the uh, sell side analysts. Uh, when your clients ask about how is this the progress on the on the legal reform going, I understand it's of course a painful and long um, process. But what are you highlighting in per in terms of positive highlights that show us that we're we're getting closer to legal reform? I well. You know, my personal pitch on Ukraine is that uh, lots of reforms has actually been done. Some of them were extremely successful, and uh, I keep kind of when I come back, I keep asking people about what they think about the new police force, and that it's part of the legal system, right? So, I think the police reform, whichever it happens, I think it, it is one of the success stories, right? Uh, so this is kind of a, my first initial comment, but uh, I would always say that the legal reform and the court system reform is probably like the 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 core of any structural reforms effort, right? Uh, for example, like in the case of Russia, right? People are keep talking about the structural reforms which are not happening, but if you look at what Russia actually does on the macro, on the fiscal, monitoring, and things like that, you see that it's actually like a major reformer uh, on, on a structural basis, like fiscal rule, you know, monetary transition and things like that. It's, it's, it's massive uh, fundamental structural reforms. But when people are talking about the structural reforms, they usually refer to this rule of law, corruption, and things like that. And of course, this is the most difficult to achieve. And this is, uh, but I mean, if this will be achieved, this is the kind of the game changer, fundamental game changer. Because if, if you fix that, Ukraine becomes, you know, European Union. One, one, one you know, just, just, just on, on the back of it. And that's, of course, the most difficult one, and that's uh, basically a work in progress. Well, I would say that uh, of all the outstanding issues on the reform front, I think the, the judiciary reform is, is the most burning because uh, smaller businesses do not have a proper recourse uh, in, in settling, say, commercial disputes with larger corporates or municipalities or the government itself because the outcome of any litigation is predetermined. And, you know, people don't get surprised here about this. And uh, I would say that in Russia, at least the highest courts, the commercial courts, the arbitration, can easily pass uh, a ruling against a government entity. I recall the customs office losing to a private company, which would be hard to imagine in Ukraine happening because, you know, the courts are perceived, or this is reality, are very sensitive to what the higher authority of the government authority wants to do and you know a, a lot of lower level courts are not properly staffed and uh, know, outright corrupt so i would say that um somehow th that reform has not been flagged as a as a benchmark for pretty much well any imf program i, I hope that world bank or ebrd would would take you know uh, a close look at it going forward but you know Ultimately, it's up to Ukrainians. It's up to Ukrainian government, Ukrainian elites, uh, Ukrainian sort of public, to demand that th this particular branch of power, the judiciary, uh, is uh, working better, because you know this is not going to be a market economy at any point uh, in the future unless there is an improvement in in, in, the, in the legal system. Uh, whenever I talk about reforms, I'm saying you need to understand that following Ukraine, it's similar to driving in the fog. You kind of know what's, uh, you kind of try to guess or like, have some feeling what will happen in the next two, three months, but you don't know what will there will be in one year. Uh, so we, we could anticipate, say, pension reform, but we couldn't do it like a year ago. Same was with the e-declaration again, with Privat and so on. Uh, now we have, you know, anti-corruption court outstanding, and the the the, the face in that is, is pretty low. The expectations that you know it will be working properly. Um, yeah, I, I'm saying, yeah, honestly, legal reform is is uh, is a genuine test of, of political system whether whether they, they want to change the country, but it's also it's also a matter of pressure. So you know, in the country which is stable, big with large reserves, um, I'm talking about Russia, right? You can you can gradually grow with your with your you know good macro policies uh, without legal reform, like at a slow pace. But you know, it can be enough for people with a certain. Um, control over the mass media. Uh, in Ukraine, I think it will not work 
um, you know, I think the shock is not reversible. I mean, the war, right? It was it was a big loss of GDP. We're not going to the pre-crisis levels easily. Uh, the population is more democratic. It will require changes, and it just without these reforms going forward, the expectations, you know, uh, not met will translate into frustration. So yeah, it will be a test, but it will be also a struggle. So I I, to, I can't agree more. The, the 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 push from civil society will be needed. Uh, the support, whatever it is from uh, from the West, uh, will be required. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a positive outlook on that, but I'm saying that there is a, there is a big uncertainty and that there is a chances uh, for it. Great. Any, any other questions? Okay, perfect. So, look, I want to thank the panel. Uh, I think you've done a great job. It's been a, a long haul today, and uh, you know it's been a late shift, but thank you very much, and, and thank you for for staying around and listening so attentively and asking some interesting questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.